uh, established under the commission's recent order approving uh, the JU's proposal for a coordinated grid planning process. Uh, welcome, I look forward to working with you. Um, what I'd like to do first is ask the uh, team members from uh, DPS staff and NYSERDA briefly to introduce yourselves. I don't think we need to uh, ask the other panel members. Uh, we can see you. We know who you are. Uh, you can see each other. I don't think we need to ask you for introductions. But um, uh, if uh, the DPS folks could start, that would be great. I can kick us off, Liz. Um, this, this is Skylar Madison. I'm the Clean Energy Planning Lead over here at DPS. Um, I'll be playing a, a key role here in the, C the CGPP process and the EPAC. Um, great to see you all, and I'll hand it over to um, Jalila. Thank you. This is Jalila Icy, Assistant Counsel. And I think I'll turn it over. Let's see, who else do we have from DPS? Adam Evans. Hi, good morning. This is Adam Evans. I'm the uh, Chief of Wholesale Markets in the Office of Markets and Innovation at DPS. And I will uh, turn it over to Lekha. Hey, good morning. This is Lekha Joan, I Chief of the Electric Safety and Reliability Section. Within the, within the Office of Energy System Planning and Performance. I will turn it over to Jerry Ancona. Jerry Ancona, um, Utility Supervisor, Electric Safety Reliability. Good morning, this is Michael Touche. I uh, also work in the Electric Safety and Reliability Group under LECA and Jerry. Kick it off to the next staff member. That might be it, Mike, for DPS. We miss anybody? If not, um, Dave Kaup from NYSERDA. Hi, uh, Dave Kaup from NYSERDA. I'll be working, I guess, uh, as an alternate uh, member with John Berniker on the EPAC, and I'll certainly be working with the team throughout the, the process. Um, I guess I'll turn it over to John. Good morning, uh, John Berniger with NYSERDA. I'm a senior advisor for transmission and will serve as NYSERDA's primary representative on EPAC. Uh, I will turn it over to Chris Hall. Thanks, John. Chris Hall, um, senior advisor at NYSERDA in the Policy Analysis and Research Unit. Does that do it for NYSERDA? I think it might. Oh, no. Uh, Nick Patton, is he on the call? Yep. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Hi, this is Nick Patane. I'm a senior project manager at NYSERDA on the policy analysis and research team. I work on our integration analysis and I'll be running through some slides on the state case later today. And I think that's it for the state team members. Uh, I will reiterate what Skylar said, which is that Skylar will, Skylar will be serving as point person for DPS uh, on, on, you know, on this group for this group uh, going forward. And we're very happy to have him. Um, <clears throat> so just a couple of uh, logistical administrative things briefly. Uh, all the uh, panelists uh, should be able to see each other and you are all uh, unmuted. You can all speak. I would suggest that we try uh, raising hands when you wanna speak. I'll, I'll try to manage the flow that way uh, when you do speak. Um, uh, please identify yourselves. I, I see a note that I'm breaking up. I'm not sure what I can do about that. Clear to me. What's that? It sounds clear. clear. It's okay. All right. I think it. Okay. Uh, so when you do speak, panelists, please you know identify your yourself. Uh, uh, that would be helpful to everybody, especially folks on the phone who are listening. Um, to the to the listeners, um, you know, you may have questions as this session goes forward. I'd ask that you please submit those questions to the EPAC email address, and we will try to get to those uh, later after the meeting, as many of them as we can. 
Um, so please use the EPAC uh, email address uh, and we will continue. We will keep that email address uh, up for the time being. Uh, we may we may switch around communications, but that's a subject for later today. Uh, that's it for logistics. Any questions, any quick questions from panelists about that? And by the way, Jalila has just reminded us in the chat of the EPAC email address. Everybody, everybody good so far? Okay. Uh, so for today, I want to talk a little bit about the immediate objective. And I, I um, you know, the EPAC is established and is intended to provide input and advice to the utilities who are responsible for carrying out the coordinated planning process. And EPAC's role is to uh, advise uh, the JU in the course of the planning. Uh, the very first task uh, established for the EPAC in the initial stage of the coordinated planning process is to uh, determine three scenarios for study. Today, uh, today we will be focusing on what we have been calling uh, the state scenario. This would be the first of the three scenarios. Um, and as you may already know, and we'll certainly learn through today's uh, discussion, uh, the, the state scenario we are presenting to you today is uh, will be provided to the NISO um, by, you know, on or before October 1st uh, for inclusion in the NISO's ongoing outlook process. And just so we're clear, work on developing this state scenario has been underway for some time. And in fact, I understand that an initial version, an initial set of assumptions for the state scenario uh, was published on the NISO's website yesterday. So we are in, we are asking the EPAC members here to kind of parachute in on a work that is very much in progress. Um, and we realize that we have convened you on rather short notice. Um, and the reasons for that is exactly, it's what I'm talking about, it's that this work has been ongoing. We are trying to line up uh, the NISO outlook process with the CGPP. Again, we're aiming for coordinated grid planning here. Uh, so because of these, uh, because of the NISO's outlook uh, schedule, we had to pull this group together quickly uh, so that we could show you the state scenario and take your, your thoughts on it. Um, and then, as I said, sign off uh, the DPS NISO team has to sign off on the state scenario with the NISO uh, by the end of the month. So our plan today uh, is to show you the work that's been going on uh, in, in the background, um, walk through that, uh, take your initial questions and, and comments. Uh, if if uh, EPAC members think that some follow up would be helpful on the subject of this initial scenario, uh, we will we'll schedule that, but it would have to be a quick turnaround again because we need to um, stay on on track to meet the NISO's timing. Uh, but we're certainly well, happy to do that. Uh, and then once we've uh, passed the state scenario on to the NISO, uh, our expectation is that the EPAC will turn to the development of the other two scenarios required for the CGPP. We will have a bit more time uh, to work through those. In fact, I, I, I expect that that could take us through the end of the year. Um, but anyway, that's the sort of uh, overarching uh, uh, trajectory of the work, at least in these initial months. So, so that our objective today is to introduce you to the state scenario. Uh, and as I said, take get initial reactions and if, if necessary, um, uh, do, uh, arrange for some kind of follow up. Uh, the other topic we want to, the other topics we want to cover today after we've uh, shown you the state scenario are administrative and logistical, you know, for the next rounds of meetings for this group. We'll talk about uh, how we want to do that additional uh, scenario planning work. Uh, we're going to figure out what process, what cadence of meetings uh, will work for folks. Um, uh, so if you can hold your kind of process and logistical questions until the end, that would be great. We'll have time to, to talk through those. 
Um, unless anybody has uh, a quick question on what I just reported, I'd like to turn to the to Nick Patane, who's going to uh, present the state scenario. So just just pause for a minute. Does anybody in the panel have any initial questions on what I what I just said? Okay, great. So Nick, if you're ready to go, you're on deck. Great, there he is. So uh, Nick, thanks very much. Great, and I think Chris is going to share some slides with us. Let's see if we can get them pulled up. Great. Um, thank you, Chris. Um, all right, so I'm Nick Patane. I'm a senior project manager at NYSERDA. I'm responsible for our integration analysis modeling toolkit. I'm joined today by a number of folks from NYSERDA. Um, also wanted to call out a couple of folks, Shard and Kevin from E3. Um, there are consultants who helped us to sort of design and implement the integration analysis, um, and I'm hoping they're going to be added soon as panelists so that they can help us uh, with some of the Q&A that will come later. Um, all right, next slide, please. So the number of things that we're going to cover today. Um, so we'll start with a little bit of background on the state case, building off what Liz just shared with us. Um, have some context on the integration analysis, what it is um, and how we're planning to use it. We'll go into some of the key load drivers. Load, the load shape is really going to be the primary assumption of the state case. And so we'll go into detail and in the buildings and transportation assumptions that sort of feed into that uh, load shape that we're proposing to use. We'll look at resulting loads and peaks over time. Um, we'll also touch on some of the supply side assumptions that we used in our integration analysis modeling that we're proposing to have replicated in the state case. Um, and then we'll wrap up with some slight differences from the published version of the integration analysis that was used for the final scoping plan. Um, we have made some minor improvements. The integration analysis is being leveraged across a number of policy analysis questions um, within NYSERDA. And so uh, we do have a slightly improved version that we're proposing to use for this exercise. And so I want to just cover some of what's different um, for the folks that are more familiar with the version that was published in the final scoping plan. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so let's start with a little bit of information on the state case, what it is and how we're using it. So um, the state team has been developing this scenario, leveraging prior work. So our proposal here is to use a load shape um, that was created within, the within an already uh, created version of the integration analysis. Um, this allows us to not have to reinvent the wheel. Um, we can sort of leverage an existing process underway and provides continuity back to some other work streams that folks are familiar with. State case will be used uh, to support two related work stream, both the NISO outlook process and the CGPP. So we'll have some interaction between those two processes as well. Scenario will be provided to the NISO by October 1st. And then, as mentioned, this is just one of three scenarios that will be used for CGPP. Um, there'll be two additional scenarios, um, and those will be uh, created, obviously, with feedback from the EPAC. Okay, next slide, please. So I did want to cover a little bit of what the integration analysis is for folks who might be a little bit less familiar with it. So the integration analysis is NYSERDA's economy-wide decarbonization pathways model that we use to illustrate how the state can achieve the sectoral requirements and economy-wide emission limits of the CLCPA. So the integration analysis includes, on the demand side, bottoms-up representation of all the major sectors of the economy, including buildings and transportation. Um, that's essentially how we're able to produce an economy-wide load shape that we can leverage for this exercise. In addition, the integration analysis has a number of supply side models. We have our own capacity expansion model within the integration analysis. We're not proposing to use those results for this exercise. We'll be doing uh, new electric sector modeling um, and we'll cover a few of the important assumptions that we want to see replicated um, in the state case process that will be run here. The model was developed to support deliberations of the Climate Action Council for the final scoping plan. Assumptions are informed by feedback from sectoral advisory panels as well as input from the independent technical advisory group. So really, um, by leveraging this case, we're able to leverage the results of all of the dialogue that went into establishing these uh, with a number of industry stakeholders. For the integration analysis, we have a number of runs. We have a reference case, and then we have three different CLCPA compliant mitigation case, cases. 
And it's really important to note that across those CLCPA compliant admission cases, uh, there's really a lot more in common than what makes them different. Across all of those runs, we see high levels of electrification, especially in buildings and transportation, and high level of adoption of energy efficiency. What makes them different is really the treatment of the hardest to decarbonize end uses. So you can think of things like uh, heavy duty transportation, um, as well as, for example, the industrial sector. Um, but across all of the top line metrics, I think most of the, uh, the metrics are really within a margin of error from each other. The state team is proposing to use a revised version of the integration analysis scenario two, strategic use of low carbon fuels for both the NISO outlook and the CGPP process. Again, this allows us to have uh, consistency with some of the integration analysis work that's already in the public domain for the final scoping plan, allows us to benefit from the dialogue that went into establishing those cases, and most importantly, it allows us to have representation of a case that we feel is compliant with the economy-wide emission limits of the CLCPA. The case was updated as part of some ongoing NYSERDA modeling, in particular, some work that we're doing to assess the impact of climate change on the energy system. We'll discuss more about that later, um, but the core assumptions and top-line findings really do remain the same. All right, next slide, please. So really the, the primary assumption set for the state case is the load. Um, so I wanted to go into some, uh, some detail about how we derive our load shape um, and what's, what are the key drivers. So starting with the building sector, um, so our model does have bottoms up representation of both the commercial and residential building stock across a variety of typologies. Um, and to achieve the economy-wide CLCPA limits, there really is a significant transformation of the building sector over the modeling period. On this slide, I'm showing on the left, the adoption of heat pumps, which is one major driver. And on the right, the adoption of more efficient building shells, uh, which is another major driver of the transformation of the building sector. So on the left, we see increasing adoption of heat pumps over time, shifting away from combustion of fossil fuels within buildings, to the point that by 2050, we've got about 7.8 million buildings with heat pumps. By 2040, it's about 5.1 million residential buildings with heat pumps. Um, and on the right, we see that by 2050, there's about 8 million residential uh, buildings that have an improved uh, efficiency cell over time. So this is really nearly every building getting some improvement to their shell. These trajectories are consistent with recommendations from the advisory panel that we should have 100% sales of zero emission heating equipment in the residential single family sector by 2030 and the residential multifamily by 2035. There's a similar trajectory within the commercial sector, which is not represented here, um, but again, it's similar in terms of adoption of electrified heating equipment, as well as deployment of more efficient shells. Next slide, please. This slide sort of shows the evolution of the transportation sector, which is similar in a lot of ways to the evolution of the building sector. Um, to achieve the economy-wide limits, there's a significant uh, transformation here happening as we're shifting away from internal combustion engines and towards zero emission vehicles. In particular, there's heavy reliance, heavy reliance on deployment of battery, battery electric vehicles. Within the, within the integration analysis, we have representation of the light, medium, and heavy duty vehicle sectors. On the left side here, we're showing the evolution of light duty vehicles, where we see that by 2050, there's about 9 million battery electric vehicles on the road. By 2040, it's about 6.7 million. On the right is the uh, evolution of electrified medium and heavy duty vehicles, starting from a point of near zero today to a point that by 2040, there's about 37,000 uh, battery electric medium and heavy duty vehicles on the road. By 2050, it's about 78,000 vehicles. Um, it's important to note that in medium and heavy duty vehicles, we also have a significant deployment of fuel cell EVs in this pathway. And the electrolysis associated with producing that hydrogen is included in our, electro in our electric sector load. These trajectories are consistent with achieving the CLCPA economy-wide limits, driven in part also by economics and policy targets from things like the ZEV MOU, advanced clean cars, and advanced clean trucks, all contributing to deployment. Next slide, please. All right, so this slide covers the resultant loads and peaks that we're proposing to use as our load shape for the state case. On the left side, we have our annual load evolution. On the right, we have our peaks 
over time. Um, and we can see that in the yellow line here, both are increasing substantially over the modeling period. This is driven by significant economy-wide electrification, for example, the buildings and transportation sector that we looked at, um, and it's slightly mitigated by the deployment of energy efficiency, for example, building shell improvements and flexible EV charging. By 2050, loads are up by over 90%. By 2040, we have a load of 253 terawatt hours, um, and peaks are also up 55% by the end of the modeling period, uh, or 42.4 gigawatts in 2040. Um, another thing to note is that we have an evolution of the system peak over time. By 2035, we've shifted away from a summer peaking system where you know, loads today are currently driven by cooling needs on the warmest days uh, to a system that becomes winter peaking as we deploy more heat pumps that are relatively poor performing at extremely cold temperatures. So again, these are both consistent with our scenario two from the integration analysis, gives us that continuity back to the integration analysis used in the final scoping plan um, and is the basis of the state case that we're proposing to use. All right, next slide, please. I'm sorry, I put my hand up. This is Aaron Hogan with the Utility Intervention Unit. Do you mind, could we go back to that slide one more time? Sure, I think we're planning to cover questions at the end. I'm not sure if there's, okay. I'm not able to really monitor the chat well, but okay. I'm happy to take one now and we can continue later. No, apologies, I can wait until the end, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, thanks Aaron, I appreciate it. Um, okay, so in addition to our load shape, there are a number of supply side assumptions that were fed into our integration analysis supply side modeling that we're proposing to have replicated in the new supply side modeling that's being conducted as part of this exercise. So I wanted to call out a few of those key assumptions here. Um, first is the treatment of DFERS, the dispatchable emission free resource in the integration analysis we call these zero carbon firm resources. These are the resources that have zero emissions that are needed to provide uh, reliability and balance the more intermittent renewable supply that we're deploying over time. I would say this is an area where there's some uncertainty around what the ultimate mix of resources might be that could provide this clean firming capacity. Um, there's currently a process underway initiated by the PSC to help answer some of these questions, exploring some of the definitional issues around what qualifies as zero emissions, as well as exploring the technical potential of some of the potential candidate resources. In the integration analysis, we model the DFER as a thermal resource using green hydrogen. Um, so green hydrogen, meaning hydrogen produced by electrolysis uh, via clean renewable energy. And we're proposing maintaining that assumption in the state case. A second major assumption is the interaction with our neighboring regions. So under the mitigation case, uh, NISO's model is having net zero imports by 2040 on an annual basis to be consistent with zero emission power, the zero emission power sector requirement. Essentially what we're trying to prevent from happening um, is we don't wanna see a system that's importing a lot of lower cost dirty power from our neighbors um, and claiming to be zero emissions. And so um, by imposing this assumption on the modeling, we're essentially able to ensure that we have enough power being generated that's clean uh, to meet our uh, load within NISO. We also have representation of the clean energy policies of our neighbors, so we do see some decline in emissions over time and want to make sure that that's included in the modeling as well. A third major category of assumption is the tier four treatment. So tier four are those projects that are going to be delivering renewable energy directly into New York City or Zone J. All the modeling cases will include both CHIPI and CleanPath, the two projects that were awarded contracts, CHIPI at 1,250 megawatts, CleanPath at 1,300 megawatts. I think one of the key areas of uncertainty is the interaction between these two tier four projects and the 70 by 30 requirement. Under the tier four order, the commission said that tier one uh, trajectories should not be adjusted for these tier four awards. In other words, uh, the two projects should be treated as incremental to 70 by 30. And I think this has a couple of benefits. One is that uh, it ensures there's more renewables in the system by 70 th by 30. And two, it acts as kind of a buffer on the tier one projects in case any of them don't materialize. As a conservative assumption in the integration analysis, we assumed essentially one of the two projects would be incremental. 
um, so that we for that project we chose chippy and one would be contributing towards 70 by 30 and that's a clean path um, again this is sort of a conservative assumption and imposing it in the state case will allow consistency back to the integration analysis modeling um, but importantly it's not intended to be a judgment on the viability of either of the projects or tier one resources um, it's just sort of a conservative assumption that we're imposing in the modeling uh, for consistency with some of the prior work that we've done. Uh, the final piece is our ELCCs, or effective load carrying capacity. Um, this is the process within our modeling toolkit of translating nameplate capacity into uh, perfect capacity or capacity that we can rely on to meet peak. Um, it's an important step for maintaining reliability within the system. For our case, we develop ELCC curves um, using E3's loss of load probability that considers sort of the growing amount of each resource that's being added over time, how it intersects with other resources being added to the system um, to maintain, to, to ensure that we have a system that maintains uh, the loss of load expectations imposed by NISO. Um, so we're proposing leveraging those ELCCs in the state case. All right, next slide, please. So I do have one last slide here, and then we can go to, to some Q&A. Um, I did want to just touch on some of the modeling updates that have happened since the final scoping plan. So as I mentioned at the outset of the call, uh, the integration analysis has become a bit of a living exercise where we're making updates over time and using the integration analysis to, to explore additional policy questions. Um, of note, we're conducting as NYSERDA a climate impacts assessment. Um, and one component of that is looking at how um, the energy system will be impacted by climate change. Um, in particular, in our modeling, we're looking at the interactive effects between uh, warming over time and the energy system. And as a result of that exercise, uh, we've made a number of improvements to the integration analysis that are reflected in the load shape that we're planning to use for the state case. One of the key updates we've met, made is that we have improved representation of space heating load at peaks. As you can imagine, for this exercise, for the, the climate impacts exercise, we've really been uh, exploring the impact of uh, heat pumps and uh, extreme temperatures, both heat, heating and, and, and cooling. Um, and so in the updates that we've made to the modeling, we do have, I think, a, a better representation uh, of heat pumps at extreme temperatures than we had used prior. Um, that update had a couple of um, ripple effects. So one is on the planning reserve margin. So the planning reserve margin is essentially the buffer on top of perfect capacity. Um, that's needed to maintain the 1 in 10 loss of load expectation requirement from an ISO. In the past, we've been able to maintain a 10% buffer in the system um, and maintain that 1 in 10 loss of load expectation. The result of the improvements that we've made in representation of space heating, we're actually seeing our peak loads are more sensitive uh, to cold temperature variability than they have been in the past. And so in our modeling, we've had to impose an increasing planning reserve margin over time. Um, such that by 2050, we have an 18% planning reserve margin as opposed to the 10% that was held uh, over the study period in prior versions of the integration analysis. Another update that was made was that we have higher flexibility of light duty vehicle charging. Um, in the past, we had assumed only 25% of light duty vehicles would be able to shift their charging away from the system peak hour. I think as a result of where we are um, in terms of technology availability, um, we're feeling like that was probably too conservative assumption. Um, so now we're imposing a 50% assumption of light duty vehicles able to shift their charging patterns away from the peak hour. The final assumption is that we have ELCCs that are improved from the version used in the final scoping plan. Um, this is again related to the first assumption. We now have a system peak that's occurring a little bit earlier in the day and, a, and a, a peak that's a little bit higher than had been uh, used in, in, a prior, in the prior version of the integration analysis. And this benefits the ELCCs, particularly of solar, which is more coincident with the earlier peak, and storage, which has a higher ELCC in a peak year system. It's important to note that the updates that were made did not have a significant impact on key top-line cost or benefit metrics, um, but some metrics have moved slightly, and I wanted to call a few of them out that are relevant for the exercise today in case folks are comparing these results directly back to the final scoping plan. Annual loads are marginally lower, about four terawatt hours or 1% lower than the version published in the final scoping plan by 2050. 
Peak loads are moderately lower in the near term. This is from the light duty vehicle assumption, but, ten, but trend higher than the published version from 2035 onwards. In particular, the 2050 peak is now about two gigawatts or 5% higher than the published version from the final scoping plan. As I mentioned, we'll be doing new supply side modeling as part of this exercise, but we did have an updated supply side model run in the integration analysis. So I did want to give folks some indication of what it did to our results. And again, they were pretty marginal. Um, so we're seeing higher peak load and planning reserve margin needs. We're driving an increased need for zero carbon firm capacity of less than two gigawatts. And the increase was uh, partially offset um, by the improved ELCC contributions from storage and renewables. So for folks who would like to uh, sort of explore this case in more detail, I did want to flag that we've published a new Annex 1 and Annex 2, Annex 1 being our inputs and Annex 2 being our outputs from the integration analysis. Um, those are available on the NYSERDA webpage under the Energy Analysis Reports and Studies Greenhouse Gas Studies at the link below. Um, and then maybe one last thing to note before we turn to, to q and I've covered a number of assumptions that are sort of uh, important to the state case. Um, but of course, there's a number of assumptions that are going to be uniform across all the cases, for example, uh, resource costs, uh, fuel prices, uh, and I think those are going to be covered in more detail in subsequent conversation. So with that, I will stop. I'll see if any of my colleagues from NYSERDA or DPS have anything that they would like to share um, or help frame, and then we can start tackling some of the Q&A. Thank you, Nick. Any follow on comments from the state team? Okay, um, Nick, I had a couple questions uh, drop in the chat. Can I, I'm going to start with those and then um, go, go to the panelists. Um, uh, Edemir asked about one of your earlier slides. What are sales shares? And that was uh, back a few slides. Or, so, what I'm showing here is the resulting stock of heat pumps and shells. To get this, we have essentially in our model a stock turnover model, um, where each year a certain number of uh, the equipment will sort of age out and need to be replaced. And so we have a sales share trajectory over time as well. We're assuming more of the replaced stock is going to be higher efficiency and heat pumps over time. Um, I didn't show those here, but some of the key milestones were included. So, for example, um, in single family homes, in this case, we're assuming that 100% uh, of turned over heating equipment will be heat pumps in the single family seg segment by 2030 and in the residential multifamily by 2035. Um, if you're interested in seeing more about how that sales share evolves over time, um, you can go to that link that was on the last page and within Annex 2, we do have sort of the trajectory of our sales share of equipment over time and how that's being uh, that's being met. Okay, Edemir, was did, did was that what you were looking for? You can unmute. Let's hope so. Um, they responded in the chat with yes. Oh, okay, good. Okay, thanks. I didn't see that. And Tom Vaccaro asks, um, what is the assumption around H2 uh, hydrogen projection? Is there New York load to reflect any green hydrogen production? Yeah, so in our integration analysis, we've assumed that the green hydrogen is being produced uh, through electrolysis and the power is being met by green electrons. Um, so in our case, we do have that electrolysis load included. Um, one of the assumptions that we've made, we haven't imposed on the model that 100% of the hydrogen has to be produced in state. So we assume that 50% will be produced in state and 50% will be imported. So uh, the amount of electrolysis load is reflective of that 50% uh, in state incremental load that would be needed. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, okay, so we're going to go to the sort of more open Q and A and Raya Salter. I think you had a you had a question. Yes, and if going forward you could clarify how you're taking questions either by hand or by the chat, so I can have a good understanding of the order of the questions taken. That would be great. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions. One, and I, I did join about five minutes late, so 
will this group and how will this group have access to various um, inputs and study information? Uh, you mentioned the NYSERDA website that will be um, public, but what, what access will we have uh, to uh, greater inputs um, and, and analysis? And in what context do we need? Will some of it be um, confidential? Will it all be public? I would argue that it should be public, but I wanna have a good understanding of the process to how we'll have access to the analysis. So that's my first question. My second question is again about this DEFR. I am very interested and concerned about how hydrogen is being modeled. It doesn't sound consistent with the scoping plan. Um, at what levels will it be modeled? I would argue, I do not think it should be. Um, I'm interested to know, it seems like we are getting out ahead of the um, PSC's conversation about what shouldn't shouldn't be zero emissions and this import scenario is also something I don't think the scoping plan discussed. So my first two questions are about process and my second is a question and deep concern about this hydrogen at what levels, um, in what case, um, is it consistent with the scoping plan analysis? And clearly, is it consistent with the climate justice working groups um, suggestions and critiques, which it, you know, I'm very concerned about this. So why don't we take that second question first and, and Nick and others can uh, answer, if you don't mind. Sure, um, thanks for your question, Ryan. Appreciate the concern. Um, we are, using an integration analysis run that's consistent with the hydrogen assumptions from the final scoping plan. Um, so this case in terms of the treatment of neighboring resources is consistent with how it was modeled in the integration analysis used in the final scoping plan. Um, and this hydrogen uh, assumption is also consistent with how it was used in scenario two for the final scoping plan. Um, so this sector, th this run was uh, compliant with the CLCPA emission limits because we're using um, green hydrogen, although all the points that you're making um, are, are, are well received and well appreciated in terms of the impact that the hydrogen resource can have. Um, I think you're right that, you know, there is a process that's undergoing uh, at the PSC that will try to help navigate these questions with stakeholders about what the ultimate resource will be. There's been other modeling results. There's been other modeling where folks have sort of created a, you know, more generic defer. Um, and I think, you know, there's just some questions about is that, you know, are, are, is, is modeling under that approach um, as useful um, as taking a resource that we think is viable and compliant. So um, this will allow us to sort of have that continuity back to the integration analysis. But I think all of your points around framing of hydrogen, the risk here and the um, ongoing process at the, the PSC to explore this a little bit in, in, in more detail, I think are, are well received. Um, it's just that we have to have this modeling run, I think, done before that um, zero emission process is going to be wrapped up at the Public Service Commission. So it's just one more clarification. So you're saying when it sounds like you've picked a scenario, you mentioned two, I believe if you could provide more detail on that information, because it sounds like you've chosen one, but there was also one that was, uh, it was called <laughs> um, the one that was the anti-combustion scenario. And it sounds like that is not the one that you've chosen here. And why was one chosen over the other then? Yeah, so I mean, I think you know one of the key things to note, as I mentioned in the presentation, is that there's more the scenarios that are compliant with the CLCPA have a lot more in common than what makes them different. They all have you know very high adoption of electrification across end uses that are possible um, and achievable. There's high adoption of energy efficiency, and then. Um, Raya, I'm, I'm sure you remember from all the CAC uh, dialogue on the integration analysis, um, when we looked at sort of the benefit cost analyses, um, the three runs were also, you know, quite within a reasonable margin of error from each other in terms of the top line. What made them different was the treatment of the sort of hardest, hardest to decarbonize end uses. So, you know, there were some differences in what technology is chosen, is chosen um, for things like the industrial sector or for the heavy duty vehicles segment. Um, if we had chosen uh, scenario three, which I think is the, the um, limited combustion case that you're referring to, again, I think a lot of the top line numbers would be quite similar. We'd see slightly higher electric loads than in the case that we're using. Um, but I think, you know, in a lot of the prior work that we've done, for example, with the NISO and the gold book process, we've used scenario two as just a representative uh, load. Um, and so by 
maintaining that assumption and using the scenario two case here, we'll have some consistency back to some other sensitivity work that we've done both within the in in integration analysis and with some external parties. All right, well, I, I find that concerning, but I do hear you. And I do recall scenario three was, um, it was less expensive, although, you know, you know, not by a, a, a huge amount, but it was less expensive. And just registering that that's a concern that sounds like a choice that's been made when we should be um, moving to scenario three, but thank you. Thank you for the feedback, Ryan. Yeah, and I can just add, although it's sort of projecting into the future, but um, I, I would expect that the next round of CGPP uh, will will take into account um, the results of that PSC proceeding that you're talking about. Um, so again, this is an iterate. This is will be an iterative uh, cyclical uh, planning process, and you know there, there will be changes and assumptions based on information uh, that develops, you know, during the interim. Um, so um, and as for your process question, um, uh, I, I think our, our, we may, we may have to kind of deal with it as we progress. Um, we are obviously not in a position to share, um, you know, confidential data. Uh, I'm not sure that the planning process that we're talking about here uh, really requires that. Um, I think it'll may, may come more clear as we go along, but uh, so far anyway, you know the 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 information that Nick was talking about on the uh, my sort of website is public. The uh, ISO um, posting of the initial scenarios and the ISO uh, outlook process, a lot of that is public, and obviously the CAC that was the foundation of some of this work. That information is available, so I think we may have to kind of punt uh, on on your question and and you know sort of see what happens um, as as we move forward. Can I add one thing to that, Liz? Sure. I think we are you know as we move forward, this is um, going to be a extended process of having the EPAC and having these meetings and developing scenarios over time. We expect to do multiple cycles of this, so we do want to develop a process moving forward where we do have more of these resources all in one place, as opposed to pointing people to NISA website, NYSERDA website, other postings, et cetera. So I think we are trying to think of something like a website or you know, reg regularly scheduled emails or something that where we bring a lot of the stuff that has been used, so you, you don't have to go searching for it. Um, but in, in the, the speed that we've had to put these things up, we don't have all of that in one place. Um, but after this meeting, I'm taking a note to um, you know, all those references that we've we've put put in so far to send links to all those all in one place. So you at least have them all in yeah. one email while we put it all together. Yeah, thanks for that reminder, Skyler. We are going to talk at the latter part of this meeting about communications and information management and stuff like that. We realize we had to put this meeting together on very short notice. Uh, so we, you know, process improvements and suggestions for process improvements are very welcome. Do we have any I do want to um, offer one more point about Raya's second question, which yeah. we missed first. Um, you know, I think Raya made some really um, compelling arguments about concerns about uncertainty about hydrogen, how it's showing up in certain scenarios, and that there's an active PSC proceeding that's going to potentially have implications for what types of emissions free dispatchable resources are. Um, being supported by the state and going to be developed in the future. And, you know, I want to remind everyone about the goal of this overall process, which is to for the utilities and, um, you know, the state to identify investments in transmission that are needed to support the CLCPA. And if an investment is anchored to an assumption that we're talking about right now that has a lot of uncertainty about around it, like, you know, how much hydrogen is going to be deployed. I think the bar for justifying to the commission that we should spend the money now on that investment will be higher. And so I do think that this does come back around to this group um, and to the, you know, to the all the stakeholders to, um, you know, to consider um, whether certain outputs of this analysis are anchored to one very specific, highly um, uncertain assumption. And if it is, um, I, I, you know, I do think that that, you know, we will address that one way or another. Um, so I just, I think they were good points and, um, you know, uh, we do have to move forward with a set of assumptions today. Uh, 
so uh, uh, ho hopefully that's that's helpful, Raya. Um, but thank you for for um, raising the issue. Quick, a uh, quick reminder to panelists, just for everybody's help. Uh, do please do identify yourself and your your affiliation. You know when you when you raise a question, that would be helpful for everybody. Um, if there, I don't see any hands up right now, but I do have a couple more. Um, Liz, 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 my hands up, and I think oh. Aaron does too. Why am I not seeing that? Yeah, Aaron Hogan and Bill Acker have hands up. I know. Okay, so Aaron, go. Thanks, Bill, for that. Um, you know, I I just want to understand a little bit. If I recall some of the assumptions in the scoping plan, um, it assumed retirements that I think were um, for wind, solar, and battery, that they were assumed to remain online through the entire study period. Um, did this, did the update um, that in this link include uh, that assumption? And if so, is it the expectation that the NISO assumes the same thing? So we do have age-based retirements built, in, built into our modeling toolkit. Um, I may see if Kevin from E3 would like to Give us a little bit more color on how that's imposed, but um, we did not make changes to our retirement uh, lifetimes in in the update that was made. So um, I believe that assumption set is consistent with what was done in the final scoping plan. But um, Can I have question, another question, Aaron, were you asking about all generation types of resources? I thought I heard you also. No, I was asking specifically, and my main issue is that assumption underlying assumption with the battery. Um, battery lives tend to be shorter than wind and solar, and to assume that they were indefinite in a study period um, perhaps was understating some of the cost. And I just want to make sure, to Zariah's point, we want to make sure we have confidence in where um, assets are being identified as being cost effective so that the transmission can be planned as carefully as possible. Um, I would characterize this exercise as trying to be a Goldilocks. You don't want to build too much, but you don't want to build too little, and you need to build it in the right place. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. And I think Soraya also uh, mentioned something as well that I strongly support is, you know, these scenarios will never get assumptions perfect, never. But for sensitivities, we can test those variables that can change the output the most. Um, you can sometimes, I've been in meetings where people will squabble over variables that will have very unlikely impact to the outcome. Um, but then there are other variables that could, and people tend to just sometimes gloss over it. So I really hope for this group we focus on those assumptions that we know could have a significant impact and work on the scenarios to test it and um, to assess and to develop the confidence in what we should be building in the near term, at least for this iteration. And so getting back to my original question, assume the assumption that these short-lived resources, short in comparison to what we have typically had on our system, to expect them to operate indefinitely in an analysis is perhaps an assumption we might want to explore if that's the expectation it continues. One point of clarification, then maybe Kevin or uh, Nick or somebody can elaborate on a related part. And so their analysis went through 2050, this analysis will go through 2040. So I think that contextually addresses part of the question because stuff that you might have been concerned would la was lasting through 2050 for a, an extra 10 years. Uh, this modeling time horizon only goes to 2040. But I'll leave right. it to the innovation. Yeah, I, I, let's get confirmation on it because I thought we went beyond 2040 for the um, capacity expansion model. 
I don't think it's customarily assumed a capacity expansion model stops the year you um, you run in MAPS. I realized the MAPS runs this through 2040, but I didn't realize the capacity expansion model was limited to 2040. That's probably as Jason raised your question, but. Yeah, I can answer, Dave. So yeah. it, it, uh, Jason, can you, can, Jason, before you start, can you introduce yourself, please? Sure. Yeah, thanks, Liz. So I'm Jason Frazier, um, Senior Manager of Transmission Planning here at the NISO. Um, I'm standing in for Yachi Lin today, who, who couldn't make it. Um, but to answer the question directly, uh, the capacity expansion model that we use in the Outlook does, doesn't explicitly model beyond 2040 or our kind of ending year, but does have a perpetual setting that assumes that the last year continues on um, because you know the world doesn't end at the end of your planning period. So you do need to recognize that uh, time goes on. But the period that we're modeling for this purposes where we introduce new variables and, and make decisions is limited to uh, 2023 to 2042 in the outlook, but I think for um, for this exercise, 2040 would be the the horizon year. Thank you for that, Jason. Again, just to follow up, I just want to. I'm sorry, Liz, if you don't mind. Um, so, if 2040 for your capacity expansion would go through 2042, but your maps model would run the 2040. Yeah, we pass we pass the capacity expansion model build out to five year increments um, starting in 2025, 30, 35, 40, and then 42, because that's our horizon year. So individual years um, without modeling in between, but the capacity expansion model models all the years in between in a consecutive way, but we only pass information to the five year increments. Okay, and then in addition to that, even though the time horizon in the capacity expansion model stops the one year after whatever year your study period is, the cost assumption, so is that everything is frozen in time? And let me take a step back. If you need a new unit three years before the study period ends, the resource expansion model should be taking into consideration what resources in competition is out to assess whether or not they need to add new capacity and what is the most cost effective um, capacity to add. So what I'm trying to understand is even though the planning horizon stops, the considerations for the cost after that planning horizon and how that's assessed. Hmm. Yeah, the great question and, and yes, considerations for cost beyond that are assessed. Um, especially consider when you're comparing two different technologies against each other and making a decision what to build and for what purpose, uh, the costs extend beyond the horizon year, but so do the benefits. Um, and then you know, they don't linearly just grow out through time. They decay in terms of benefits because of inflation and um, discounting that we have assumed in the model. So it's able to make that decision outside of the study period that we're, we're modeling explicitly in recognition that, you know, the world continues on, but costs and benefits continue to either grow or decay. I think that's what you're asking, right, Aaron? Does yeah, is it, it just is. assuming it the world is. ends and then in correct? It, 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 it's not like a solid wall that you stop and don't take into consideration any aspects behind beyond the study horizon. Yep, and I can confirm it is not a solid wall, and it you know it does consider continuation of uh, costs and benefits uh, beyond the, the final study year. But I guess the question to Dave Kaup's point is whether or not something is retired beyond the horizon. And I would imagine to the extent of uh, the capacity resource model 
that may have elected to put in a battery storage in 2028 with a life expectancy, we'll say 10 years, I know people can debate that, say 10 years out to 2038, fine, it replaces itself, but then with the expectation it would operate out to 2048. It's getting to the assumption that was in the scoping analysis that assumed storage, wind, and um, solar operated indefinitely during the lifetime of the analysis. And that's the part I want to make sure we feel comfortable with in this forum. So the only difference between those two models is going to be cost. So if, if your presumption is that it gets replaced in kind with just an updated technology, or not even technology, but of the same technology in place, the only difference will be cost. So you'll see, you know, potentially some degradation uh, reduction because of a new unit. If you're under the presumption that it could get replaced by a different technology because the time period, so if you're assuming 10 years down the road, maybe you don't need as much storage and you get replaced with something else, then it would be slightly different. But I would say I'm not worried if you're going on the assumption that it's just getting replaced in kind. Uh, if you're really looking for costs, that's when you would look at that. Um, I'm not 100% sure if this exercise is intended to just look at cost. Uh, in, in a lot of it is a feed in for later stages of CGPP. Okay, but let me just ask you another, just another question. This might be the, an easier way to get to the point. Some concern about, if, if we could just for cadence, because we're spending a lot of time on this particular modeling issue, and I know they're also urgent. So if, if we could, I, I'm just asking for the facilitators, if you could, you know, I know we don't have a lot of time. So if you could just let us know what the expectation is in terms of questions and managing them. I, yeah. I, don't have it, I don't have any particular expectation. I think we should try to answer as many questions as we can. But as I indicated earlier, um, staff is open to scheduling uh, a follow up, you know, a follow up in, in short in, 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 in near time. So people can think about what they saw and bring bring forward additional questions. So um, I, I, I'd like to try to Aaron, if we can wrap your question. You know, yeah, uh, let okay. let me cut to the chase then. Let me see if yeah. this will be easier. I I don't mean to dominate it, but these are types of questions that are going to be essential to make sure we understand and we do our job as an advisory council. Um, and so that when we're going through and getting a transmission bill, like I said, it is the Goldilocks hoping we get it not too big, not too small, right place. That's it. We've got um, urgent questions about DEFRs and other types of generation. Okay, and great. So let's let me ask this um, into staff. You mentioned um, that NISO just posted some things, and so too did you folks just post this presentation yesterday. Is is there a way that perhaps we should line up the? NISO's assumptions and walk through them one at a time and not necessarily now, I'm not saying I'm going to do that, but from a process perspective, and I think that could create the order. Um, so we go through things in a punch list and confirm how things are going to be uh, modeled at the let, NISO. Let, let, me, let, let, me, let me try to answer that and Jason may have a, Jason Fraser from NISO may have a better answer. My understanding is, um, there's going to be, I think it's an ESPWG meeting in a day or so at which uh, NISO will, will be reviewing the matrix of its assumptions. Jason, you want to go from there? Sure. So, Aaron, we posted on Monday morning for the Thursday or tomorrow's, uh, oh wait, sorry, Thursday's ESPWG, um, a, an assumptions matrix very similar to what we've done in previous Outlook cycles, except for this time we've called out an explicit column for assumptions that we have proposed thus far, um, or at least our kind of uh, straw man proposals for those individual assumptions. And you can find that on the NISO website. I can throw a link in the um, comments here. Please but do. That, that should be a good spot to start doing exactly what you're saying, go one by one. See not only what the proposal is, but you can see what it, how it might differ from what the, the NISO policy scenarios 
uh, are being proposed to look like. Okay, I think Bill Acker has been waiting for a while. Bill, do you have a question? I, I have a few, but I'll try to keep them to keep them down here. Uh, but uh, so, so, uh, and this is Bill Acker with New York Best uh, to, to go by your rules there, Liz. Um, Thank you. The, uh, um, I guess what, where I would like to go for a moment is actually a, completely away from Goldilocks to scenarios, um, because I think it's pretty clear that nobody is going to predict our load and our generation 10, 15 years from now in New York State with any accuracy. Um, we need to have scenarios, and obviously the, the coordinated grid planning process was set up to have multiple scenarios for that exact reason. Um, and so I appreciate uh, this really good uh, presentation of one of the scenarios. Um, I, my question, my first question, and I have a couple to follow, but uh, my first question is around the scenarios. We, we've indicated that you were going to have two more scenarios. Uh, when we've talked about this in the past in some of the advisory group work last year, we talked about scenarios on the supply side and scenarios on the load side. And so there's kind of two ways you can look at that. You can look at scenarios on the supply side and scenarios on the load side. And if you had three of each of those, that's actually nine scenarios. Um, uh, how, what is our thinking right now on the other scenarios? And what is our thinking on the um, breaking up of load scenarios and supply side scenarios? Are we thinking that there's three scenarios completely that are combinations of load and supply side? Or is there any opportunity to think about having multiple supply side scenarios and multiple load side scenarios? And I, I really am extremely concerned that we can back ourselves into a false sense of security uh, with regard to how accurately we think we can predict something in the future, where we really need to be thinking probabilistically here and saying, you know, if this happens, it costs X. If this happens, it costs Y. But this solution actually does well for both of those. And this solution looks good for X, but doesn't look good for Y. And if we choose it, we could be really wrong. We need to have that conversation. I, I, I think, Bill, that's the point of, of uh, building out the additional two scenarios. And if possible, I think we should punt for the discussion to the, another meeting. Sure, I'm happy with that. Um, the other uh, piece that I'd like to just bring up quickly is on the defer point. Uh, I agree there shouldn't be a policy discussion of which defer is the right defer. Um, the, there are, though, some big differences for transmission and, and distribution on the defer choices. And, 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 and kind of there's, there's two classes of defers. There's one class of defer where the defer is actually able to absorb curtailed renewable energy. And that class includes locally produced green hydrogen, it includes batteries, it includes long duration energy storage, where you actually can not curtail the renewables we use of renewable energy and shift it to a later time. And then there's another class of defer that doesn't uh, do that. Um, and uh, so you're selected green hydrogen, mostly local, half locally produced. So you're kind of you know, splitting the difference there, um, which is probably reasonable for the assumption from my mind, although I, I obviously prefer to be able to actually achieve the curtailed renewables. Um, but with that said, are, what's your thinking on the green hydrogen production? Are you smearing it over all hours of the year? Or are you thinking that it is somehow tailored more or driven more during <clears throat> high renewable production times? Um, and I realize it's, a, it's not a correct answer to that question, but it matters to the modeling. Um, because if, you, you know, if you're doing the one, you're looking more like a long duration energy storage system. If you're doing the other, you're looking more like a standard green hydrogen plant, and that might matter to our to our choices here going forward. So I'm curious about that one. Yeah. So thanks for the question, Bill. Um, so in our in our modeling, we do have some essentially flexible load associated with the green hydrogen production. So we're not trying to model this in a way that it would. You know, be operating, for example, and adding further stress to the grid at peak times. So we do have sort of a flexible representation yeah. of our electrolysis load to avoid those outcomes. Um, not sure if the folks from E3 would like to add a little bit more, but we did try to, you know, avoid a situation where they're, um, you know, further uh, uh, increasing the, the peak loads if they don't need to be. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say that that's right, Nick. And we do 
assume that hydrogen production you know, largely takes place during times of high renewable output to to take advantage of of those resources. Um, and we're we're currently comparing notes with the NISO team on uh, how they're planning to incorporate that into into this modeling exercise. Okay, thanks, thanks, Kevin. Because because then from a um, from our perspective for for the transmission and distribution planning your results look exactly the same as a long duration storage. So pretty much, you know, so the green, the green hydrogen peaker plant, long duration, 100 hour storage from a transmission distribution is probably gonna look pretty similar then in this case. So, so, so that seems reasonable to me, um, uh, you know, and uh, with the question about the 50% import from other states, and we probably should get an idea how much energy that is or how much effect that would have, but that sounds reasonable. Um, the last question, can, do you have time? For, do I have time for one more, Liz? Or? Go ahead, but go ahead, Bill. Okay, last. Well, actually, I've got five more, but I'll do the last one more. <laughs> Save the other ones. Um, the ELCC, um, uh, increased ELCC. Um, uh, I, I think, you know, as you guys are well aware, the NISO's view of ELCC is is to use a marginal ELCC to uh, to steer uh, resource uh, uh, deployment, uh, as opposed to to accurately represent the actual contribution of the resources. Um, when you said you increased your ELCC. Are you, is that mirroring the ISO's marginal or are you using a fleet average version that actually accurately uh, reflects the contribution of the yields to the resources to the uh, low carrying capability? And, and the reason why I'm asking the question is, is I'm wondering if there's a divergence with what the ISO is gonna be doing in the future and whether we need to think about that. Nick? Nick I'm happy to take that one as well if, you, if you'd like. Yeah, I think we do have consistency in looking at this as kind of a marginal approach, but Kevin, maybe if you want to share more of the details on how we implement it. Um, the shift is really that we're seeing is more to do with how our load shape has evolved from uh, the version that was published in the final scoping plan versus today. So because our uh, peak is occurring slightly earlier in the day, that's more uh, coincident with solar output. And because the system is peakier, um, that particularly benefits storage. Um, in terms of the methodology, I think we're we're fairly consistent in looking at a marginal resource. Um, we do sort of consider the aggregate amount of solar and wind that we're adding to the system and the interactive effects between things like solar and storage. Um, Kevin, you may want to add a little bit more um, for, for for Bill here. Yeah, that, that's exactly right, Nick. And I'll just add that for, for capacity expansion framework, the inputs to that are are always a marginal ELCC input for the model of decision-making. I think there's a distinction here between the use of marginal ELCC in a, in a modeling context versus the distinction between average and marginal in a market context. But for a capacity expansion framework, uh, we have consistently used marginal for the integration analysis. And my understanding is that is what is intended for uh, the NISO modeling exercise as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's Liz. Um, I think we have a couple of questions related to the uh, the reserve margin. One is from Chris, uh, Chris Wentlet uh, for the uh, Municipal Electric Utilities. Chris, you can pick this up, but I'll just read your question. Your mo modeling assumes zero imports from neighboring regions in 2024. How does that impact your reserve planning margin requirement? Thanks, Liz. Uh, just one correction. I think it was supposed to say 2040 versus oh. 2024. Yeah, 40, 40. Yep. Okay. And I'm, it, it, if I'm understanding kind of that that point, you're saying that New York basically becomes more of an island versus leaning on neighboring pools. And I just want to make sure I understand that aspect. And then secondly, um, you have reliability planning margin, and then you have, in New York right now, we operate to a reserve margin. I just wanna make sure I understand if there's a difference in the terms. Sure, I'll, I'll start, others may wanna um, add as well. So it's not necessarily that we're, you know, increasingly becoming an island. I think we have a, we're trying to avoid a situation where we're seeing a large increase in net imports as we're starting to impose zero emission requirement. We don't wanna see a system that's bringing in more dirty power. 
So I think a lot of the modeling that we've done today has sort of a similar amount of imported power, just that on an annual basis, we're having uh, zero net imports. So you know, we've got enough power to meet our, our annual load. Um, so I don't think that really changes our reserve margin over time. I think it's sort of similar to how we've done the system uh, to date. We've got sort of a similar magnitude of imported power. And so the reserve margin um, in that sense is not changing because of the import assumption. Um, the second piece uh, in terms of the difference between installed reserve margin and planning reserve margin, the folks from NISO may want to weigh on this, weigh in on this as well, and, and Kevin may want to as well. Um, but I think, you know, our, our, I think they're trying to do a similar thing, the installed reserve margin being on uh, UCAP performance and our planning reserve margin being on ELCC perfect capacity. Um, I think there's some difference in terms of like, uh, firm generators UCAP treatment versus their uh, ELCC um, treatment. And so the, they're similarly looking at sort of a buffer on top of perfect capacity. Um, it's just that, you know, we're doing ours through an ELCC type methodology. Um, let me pause and see if folks want to add a little bit more color on, on either of those replies. On the NISO side, you, you got it, Nick. It's we're, we're accounting for um, ELCCs and the declining capacity contribution of certain types of renewables to our reserve margin to meeting load through time, or as more are added. Chris, okay, thank thank you, Les. Okay. I'd answer it. Okay, thank and you. similar question. Maybe we've already answered it, but um, Paul Herring asked. Uh, uh, can you explain the difference between planning reserve margin and installed re reserve margin? Paul, are you you set with the answer so far? Yeah, yeah I think I am good, Liz. I think just Jason um, or Nick, you know, with regard to LCRs, uh, are they being modeled discreetly or is it really just looked at on the state on a statewide average with regard to the planning reserve or installed reserve margins? Uh, LCRs are embedded into the model, or at least um, explicitly modeled. And uh, is, I'm sorry, Jason, is that changing over time with the change in topology, you know, like yes. for instance, with the Lone Island project and things like that, that might have impacts on, you know, zone K's LCRs? Yes, correct. So I think we haven't gone to stakeholders yet with that assumption in the outlook itself, but I believe at this time, and this is open for everyone's opinion, um, that the assumptions that would happen in the scenarios for the outlook would be consistent with this state scenario uh, that's being done for CGDP. But the, in, the intention is to adjust LCRs through time in recognition that topology is changing. <clears throat> And Paul, you represent what fine organization? I'm sorry. Yep, New York Transco. Sorry, Liz. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Really important. Lisa, I have a I have a question as well, and I've been in a queue for a while. But, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. Go go ahead, Rodica. <laughs> and and remind everybody who you're affiliated with here. Yes. So I'm with EDF Renewables and representing AC New York. Um, so the I have a, maybe a couple of questions and uh, several of my comments were addressed earlier, but one maybe philosophical question is at the end or, or over time is um, the staff thinking that um, the New York ISO policy scenario will become the state policy scenario because the policy would kind of be the same and that will ensure consistency and maybe less work over time to create multiple scenarios. Would that be the intent over time to merge? I mean, to have just that policy scenario. Yeah, so I guess I should probably let Jason answer some of this, but my current understanding is that the NISO is doing, is it three policy scenarios? Is that the plan now, Jason? That's right, Jason. And the state scenario would be one of them. And that would, state scenario would be in the outlook process as well as the CGPP process. Then there's two more scenarios to be defined uh, by this advisory panel for the CGPP process. Does that help answer the question? Yes, it, it helps. Um, it 
I, I guess it helps um, for consistency. It seems like you would expect that a policy scenario could be the same, uh, but I understand the need for sensitivities as there is a lot of uncertainty on demand and um, other critical assumptions. Um, and one other question I have on the uh, interaction between dispatchable free renewable resources and um, the onshore uh, solar and wind. Um, what are the expectations for requirements modeled 70% by 2030, but after that, what is the expectation for renewable additions in this in this state case? And how are dispatchable free renewable resources like the leftover or how was that interaction between the two? I can, I can jump in with a little bit here. I think we're, we're modeling out to 2040, including all the, the decarbonization policies, but the, the model itself is going to have the choice between these different resources. There's going to be different costs for different resources in different years, different availability of solar, wind, hydrogen resources in the model. Um, and so we we are not pre-setting, you know, what percentage of renewables has to be built, you know, past 2030. There's no, there's no set megawatt quantities beyond the um, ones that are already built into the CLCPA. The model will be helping us choose, you know, the least cost build out to hit those decarbonization policies. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. And maybe for context, in, in a separate integration analysis supply side model, the zero carbon firm resources is quite expensive. Um, so it's not something that's providing baseload power. It's really balancing resources. So in all the models, modeling runs that we've done in the integration analysis, we see you know pretty aggressive adoption of land based wind, solar, offshore wind as we're sort of ramping up to the zero by forty requirement. Thank you. And the cost information, will that be published uh, somewhere or be made available to the EPAC members? I believe so. I believe we're building through the NYSERDA supply curve study. Um, we're trying to build a, you know, a, a whole list of these um, different you know, zonal and by county, all the, the different resource availability, the different costs over the different years. And we're putting that together now for review by the EPAC and inclusion in the, the NISO modeling. I think it's, it's challenging with the timetable we have here. We're going to take it back and figure out what kind of information can we compile in the time available to us <clears throat> and then circle back to, to folks to, to share that. And maybe one last question on the, the trends for um, um, electrification and slides five and six that we are showing earlier, those reflect like the policy assumptions. Is was there any sensitivity done to what might be economically or technically feasible? So these are kind of the what's needed. So our, our case is really demonstrating the levels of deployment that would be required to hit the economy wide. Uh, CLCPA emission limit. So, um, the sort the core case and the assumptions that are embedded here um, are partially informed. For example, transportation on economics, um, as well as a number of the sort of policies that are on the books. So, looking here, like the ZEV MOU, advanced clean cars, advanced clean trucks. Um, but there's certainly incremental work that needs to be done to be able to achieve this level of adoption. Um, there are a number of sensitivities that we've done in prior work um, that explore different, you know, components of this. Um, but the case is really intended to show here, you know, what's needed to hit the emission limits for, for the CLCPA. Um, and I think another component of it is that we're trying to take advantage of natural equipment turnover. So, you know, you could imagine a situation where there's forced retirements that are uneconomic in the future. And we've tried to avoid those kinds of situations um, by increasing the sales shares earlier. Um, and trying to take advantage of natural equipment turnover. Uh, it's Liz, I'm going to take another one of the questions from the chat just so we don't don't miss it. And that is from the, the mayor's office. Julia Casagrande asks, uh, what assumptions were used for Con Ed steam system electrification? Yeah, it's a good question. I may need to tap my E3 colleagues for a little bit more 
information. I do think we had, we tried to, I believe, use some hydrogen um, for the Con Ed STEAM system, consistent with some of what the literature was saying in our core case. Um, and so that hydrogen load would certainly be embedded in our assumptions. Um, I'm not sure how much electrification, um, I mean, obviously there's buildings connected to the seam system that are being electrified and that load is being uh, added over time. I'm not sure if we've added any um, electrified boilers to the to the steam network. Um, maybe shower it if you're available and, and have that assumption handy. Otherwise we can follow up, Julia. Yeah, so I can, this is shout out from E3 um, and I can say that we tried to align with the Pathways to Carbon Neutral New York study from a, a couple of years ago in terms of the amount of building space that that continues to, to use steam and, and then therefore the amount of steam that actually needs to be produced. And so we see, um, you know, I'll to remember the specific assumption, but I, I think it's something like 60% reduction in the demand for the steam system by, by 2050. So first of all, there's, you know, a lot of electrification. And so that's there, there's that decline in demand. And then Nick, as you flagged, the remaining steam that's required, we assume that that is produced with with hydrogen um, as opposed to, you know, currently where it's mostly natural gas and oil that, that produces that steam. Great. Uh, is that, does that work, Julia? Yeah. Um, hi, that makes sense. Um, I know that Conrad is looking at various um, electrification options um, for their steam production as well, and it's big. Um, if they do go that route, so um, that's why I'm asking the question, but thank you. Okay, great. Um, Jeff Marr from National Grid, you had your hand up. Hello, Jeff Marr from National Grid. Uh, a question about your load assumptions. We know that, um, or, or we've seen a lot of discussion in the NISO forums about several very large spot load increases. Um, you know, for example, I think there's a, a very large um, a uh, semiconductor manufacturer that's proposing to connect into the Syracuse area is just one of the examples. Uh, how are these large loads reflected in the, the load forecasts? Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, so in the version that I showed here, we don't have those large loads added, um, but we are exploring um, with our NISO colleagues, uh, what are those major loads that we're expecting and planning to uh, hopefully find a way that we can add those um, into our load shape and then hopefully capture it also in future iterations of the integration analysis. So wasn't in some of the prior work, um, appreciate the importance of it. So we're, we're exploring ways that we could have it included in the state case. Thanks. Appreciate that. I mean, given the, the potential for a very high, you know, load factor 24 seven operations, we, we would encourage that to be included to the best of our ability in this, this round. Yeah. Thanks for that flag. Thank you. Uh, Rada, you had a couple of questions, I think, and please identify your affiliation. Thank you, Liz. This is Radha Surya from Invenergy representing IPNI. I have a couple of questions on slide number 10, where you talk about GB and um, CPNY modeling. I would like to understand the incremental modeling uh, you mentioned, right, with the capacity factors, how these will be modeled, and GB being an import, um, I assume, because it is bringing the renewable generation, it is modeled at a higher capacity factor without you know, zero input. Can you explain a little bit more into the detail? Sure, I'll start and then Kevin may want to add some more. Um, so Chippy is modeled as 1250 megawatts, megawatt, megawatts of firm capacity coming into zone J, as you noted, a higher capacity factor. We've got 95% capacity factor um, and this is essentially clean power coming into zone J. Uh, for clean path, it's modeled as 1300 megawatts and it's, uh, we've obviously got a number of renewable generators associated with that project that we have included in our modeling. Um, and then the line comes as a 1300 megawatt uh, project of bi-direct, bi-directional transfer capacity. Um, we, in, in the integration analysis, we do super zonal modeling. So it's essentially a connection between zones A through E and zone J. Um, so that's how we, we're treating it in our in our modeling. Um, and then I think you had a question about sort of the treatment of what's incremental and what's 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 not. Um, as I mentioned, I think you know the tier four initiating order said that we shouldn't be adjusting tier one procurement trajectories for inclusion of the tier four projects. And I think that had you know two effects. One, it in theory will increase the amount of renewables in the system by 2030. 
Um, and it also acts as kind of a buffer of, you know, tier one procurements that may not come online by 2030 for whatever reason. Um, so if we had imposed that in the modeling, we'd have essentially two projects on top of 70 by 30. It would be a, a lot of renewables in the system. In our modeling that we've done to date, we've taken sort of a conservative assumption where we've essentially assumed one of the two projects is incremental to 70 by 30 and one is contributing towards 70 by 30. Um, this will lead to less renewables being built in the model um, by 2030. So it's conservative in that sense. It also ties back to the core assumption set of the integration analysis. So it has that benefit. Um, but as I mentioned, when we were kind of on the slide, it's not intended to be a statement on the viability of tier one projects or either of the tier four projects. Um, we're doing this as kind of a conservative assumption that allows us to tie back to the uh, original scoping plan results. Yeah, my I think my question uh, is more directed to given the curtailment scenario, like you mentioned, it's a lot of renewables when you have incremental right of two, 1300 and 1250, which would be curtailed more in this kind of scenario in the economic analysis. I'm not sure I know how to answer that question. Um, Kevin, I don't know if you have any feedback. We can take it back and think about it a little bit well, more as well. It's a good question for Kevin and our team, but it's also an equally valid question collectively with NISO because they'll be running Plexos and I'm not sure how it will look at curtailment choices with a bunch of renewables on the system. I think we can take it back. We can, um, I can connect with staff and we can discuss further on this. Thank you. I do have one follow up question on the sensitivities uh, considering the uncertainties around hydrogen, DEFRs, and you know the COD of the HDC because there are new technology coming on. Are there any sensitivities included? So I think this sort of goes to maybe Bill's question as well of, you know, wanting to think about the matrix of supply and, and demand side. So um, I would say let's continue that this discussion in, in that context and the design of the two additional EPAC scenarios, and making sure that we have adequate coverage of uh, potential outcomes. Sure. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, that's what I was going to say as well. You know, there has been uh, sensitivities in previous work that looks at, you know, different outcomes here, but in terms of the, the EPAC work to design CGBP scenarios, we have kind of a central one we're trying to develop right now, and we haven't even started the work on, you know, designing two new scenarios, two other scenarios to help bound these things, and these are on the table as options for what we can um, evaluate for inputs there. Thanks for that, Skylar. I want to, it's Liz, I want to do a brief time check um because you know the um we have a fair amount of administrative stuff to talk through i was going to propose that we go uh, uh about five to noon with questions here maybe take a five minute uh break and then uh do the last bit of the meeting between 12 and 1. does that sound okay to everybody i see one thumbs up from somebody Sounds good. Okay, so we'll so we'll take questions for another 20 minutes or so and then um, quick break and then come back and do the, the last part of the agenda. And as I said earlier, if, if folks want to schedule a follow up for more questions after you've had a little more time to uh, look at some of these materials and think about them, you know, we're, we're totally, totally open to doing that. Um, at the moment, I think I see two, two questions out there. One, uh, uh, Raya, did we? Uh, get to all of your questions. And, and Liz, I don't want to jump in front, but uh, uh, my hands been up for I a see while. You, Bill. I yeah. see you. I see you. <laughs> I I thought you might have thought it was a legacy hand because I have to put it up pretty shortly after the question. But it's, it's always you know, it's always that possibility. But if, I... <laughs> if, if you don't mind, I, I just had one more follow up question. Sure. Uh, and it, it's it's got to do with the uh, uh, geographical granularity of our models. Um, I, I'm I'm wondering about kind of the the uh, what the thinking is around uh, the step from taking the E3 uh, integration analysis level model. Uh, and and using that as an input to the utility studies and and I 
my, my impression is that we there's a layer of geographic granularity that needs to be added to what was being presented today. Um, uh, and and uh, so I'd just like to get the people's thoughts uh, on um, you know, what is the geographic granularity of, of what was presented today? Is, is that zonal? And, um, you know, do we, do we have to, what, what are your thoughts on the, getting that to what would be the inputs to what the utilities would be working with uh, for, for the modeling they'll have to actually do? Yeah, I, I can kind of take this first, then maybe pass it off to, to Nick or Jason. But um, what we saw today was not necessarily the, the modeling that we're going to be using. This was mainly to be the assumptions that will um, help inform the modeling we'll be doing through the NISOS Plexos modeling. So the, the assumptions in terms of the, like, I think we call them super zones, uh, that super zone level granularity through the integration analysis, that's less granular than we're going to be able to be in the, the NISO modeling that we're, that we're taking up right now. In the NISO modeling that we are going to be doing for this first state scenario, at worst, we're going to be looking at a zonal representation, potentially with some um, triggers to sh to show you know individual sub subzonal characteristics if if possible. Um, but a lot of the information we're able to feed in is even more granular than that, in terms of you know potentially being able to put a uh, county level supply curve for renewables in there. You know maybe utility more utility specific assumptions on load profiles. But we're kind of working on developing how granularly that can be to get into the modeling. But um, in general, a, a lot of things will be more granular than what was you know done in the integration analysis modeling. But it will be using similar assumptions as what was in the integration analysis. Ah, that's very helpful, Skylar. Thank you. That's, that got to exactly what I was looking for. Great, good. Um, uh, Raya left a uh, question in the chat. I don't. I, I assume it's still uh, germane. By the way, Raya uh, is uh, uh, occupies a seat here for the Energy Justice Law and Policy Center, uh, and the question um, is: uh, she asked for clarification about the the retirement assumptions for generation. So, can you speak to that, um, Nick? Or we do have some age-based retirements in our modeling. Um, all of them are sort of detailed on, in our Annex 1, um, our inputs assumptions. You can sort of see what we're assuming in terms of retirements over time, um, retirements associated with policy as well as age. Um, I may need Kevin to provide any more granularity, but um, you know we are discussing these with NISO colleagues as well and you know trying to align on what the right uh, retirement assumptions should be for for this case. Uh, can I ask a follow up question on that? Sure. Uh, yeah, this is Jeff Marr from National Grid. You know, a, as we look at CGPP and we move into like stage two and stage three, right? The utilities will be doing specific modeling, like very specific modeling. Uh, so will this will the retirement assumptions for which specific units are assumed to be retiring be available for that modeling effort? Uh, not a modeler here, but I'm not sure I understand the question. So, so when we do power flow models, we have to make assumptions about, you know, very specific generation assumptions when load assumptions and transmission topology assumptions, right? So, so one of the key factors within these models will be which generators do we turn off? Which specific machines do we shut down? Um, so I'm assuming that whatever we're assuming within these capacity expansion modeling efforts for generation retirement will have to be available to the planners when they do their analysis. And I would just like to confirm okay. that those specific machine retirement assumptions will be available for that modeling effort. Thanks. I, this is, I'm oh, sorry, Liz. No, I was just saying thank you. Now I understand the question. <laughs> right, so I mean, this is a, that, a, joint, com, a joint answer. Um, you know, I think we had some guidelines for age-based retirements, which we're discussing with the NISO and, you know, whether they need to be phased in rather than some of them instantaneously retiring tomorrow because they're at an age limit. And we're kind of trying to talk through that. But, um, you know, then I think the subsequent question is, 
you know, with an ISO, you know, we need to take this back and talk about it some more, is, you know, will will Plexos beyond the age based retirements and like inclusive of the age based retirements, but other retirements. Uh, I'm I'm mixing two concepts here. Obviously, if you have an age based retirement, you know what retired <laughs> if you're retiring it. So that's one thing. But there's also economic retirements then um you know that information i guess you have a question about whether that's being provided I'm, my hunch is yes but you know jason should wait. no i mean i think this i think we might be making this a little bit more complicated than the question actually is and i think the answer is just yes you know <laughs> if when, as soon as we come up with the assumption whether it's 47 or 60 years or phased in over three years in the interim model we're going to yes, have that assumption so the age, and then the age based part that's why i said i was mixing things together the yep. age-based stuff is straightforward. When you know when something aged out, you know what it was. Mike, what I was elaborating on is more the economic mm -hmm. retirements. And and, and I think the answer there should probably be um, yes as well, just because it will be the outputs. And if that's the outputs of our scenarios, those are the things that are going to be inputs to stage two um, right. at the moment. Maybe some of the confusion may be coming from the super zonal or like that zonal topology that was discussed earlier, but I would assume that in that capacity model, New York ISO will have the units model. You will they'll have like call unit specific plants modeled. Therefore you'll have the unit specific information, even if it's represented within a larger zone than the traditional any traditional zoning. Right. So you know Plexos is going to get information from the work that we are providing. So in a way that it can be done at a zonal basis, age-based stuff will be yes, you'll know what retired or what didn't retire based on age, and then there'd be some other potential economic retirements, which, you know, in my experience, that is something you can know what individual units are and, and articulate that. But I should stop, and we should stop, and let Jason weigh in because ultimately it's Plexos and NISO who's doing the capacity expansion model. Is that true? you'll be able to articulate specific economic thermal retirement or other re unit retirements. So yeah, Je Jeff Jeff knows why he's asking. So there's confidentiality issues in um, market sensitivity issues within with publicly putting out retirements from models. The models have no difficulty in in figuring out what to economically retire or not. Um, so I, I think from an age-based perspective, there should be no issues saying, right. you know, it's public knowledge, the age of, of the units when they were installed. And then if you put just a rule-based retirement, that's not a problem. Um, I, I do think we will run into some difficulties being able to provide public list of generators that could be economically retiring or potentially being forecasted to retire at some time based on NISO models. Or based on CGPP models, so I think we can. I think we have to bring this back and talk about it a little bit more. Um, my my suggestion is, if we want to get around this and not have to do this step and, and worry about the confidentiality, if we just do rule based retirements based on age, that would be quite a bit easier um, to, to get around. So that's something to think about, you're saying, Jason? Yeah, I, I think we need to think about that a little bit more. And, and Jeff, am I right? And, and Jeff's right. If we want to go to the power flow world, which is happening in the next stages, um, the modelers there are going to know, need to know explicitly which generators are retiring, which year, uh, so on and so forth. So he, he's just making sure we can do that. Um, I'm sure Jeff knows the sensitivity around announcing economic retirements. Well, and that, that also goes to the other half, which is the new generation from do the power flow, which is why I was asking the granularity question, the geographic granularity question earlier. And it seems like this whole piece should be a topic of discussion going forward, Liz. I, mean, I think it, it's, it's, you know, uh, you know, we routinely, you know, we sign confidentiality when we deal with the ISO and on these kinds of things, it might be necessary to do some things like that. It might be necessary to do some other things, but we, we really have got to make sure both halves of that are, are addressed, both the retirements and the new stuff geographically. 
Yep, no, I think that's a there's follow up here. Yep. Um, before we go uh, to another live question, I got another chat question uh, from Rodica Donaldson, and she asks uh, on EVs and distribution infrastructure if any feedback loop was done, including to well, Rodica. Maybe you should just state your question. It's a little hard to. Uh, yeah. Read. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So my question is, um, you know, the forecast show uh, large amounts of uh, electrical um, vehicle integration, and that will come with a lot of um, distribution infrastructure, and that can also drive more DRs. So the question is, if this kind of like type of interactions will be looked at as part of the DER forecast for CGPP, and um, in kind of like in general when we look at the distribution needs. Anybody? I think the the high level answer is yes, there is a bit of a feedback loop here. Um, the original proposal for developing the CGPP here was to have at least three touch points for the distribution slash DER considerations to kind of rise up in the evaluation process. I think the first one is in stage one to stage two, where we're looking at, um, you know, determining what the DER build out should be and then seeing some of the initial results and seeing if we need to adjust um, the forecasts or the DER builds in any way to account for those kind of lower voltage potential issues. Um, so that's something that will come up as we go through stage, definitely in stage two at the very latest, um, probably in stage four and five as well, just to look at, you know, make sure we're still accurate in what we're thinking for DERs. Um, but th there are going to be just to put a plug in for some some other um, processes at at the DPS and PSC right now. There there will be other analysis ongoing to look at more granular what that feedback actually is because this process right now is fundamentally not a distribution planning process. We don't want to lose sight of that because it's very important and it, it overlaps quite a bit. But we're trying to focus on kind of the higher level um, renewable build outs at the transmission side and any like local TND um, bill that's usually at the higher voltages, but we will have those touch points for the lower voltages as we go. Yes, and I'm asking this because in some areas we're already seeing um, the problem with both DR and utility scale renewables on when uh, both are on the, when um, uh, utility scale are on the low voltage 115 130 kV so as you start having a lot of DR in a particular area you may see that headroom being eaten up by DRs if it's not coming with um, additional infrastructure on the low on the transmission side as well yep definitely something good to track there's you know that potential for cannibalization um, in different sections of the network but it's definitely something to keep track of and there is also the disconnect between DR coming very coming online very fast versus a building transmission. Uh, yes. Um, just as a reminder, I asked uh, my colleague Jalila to um, share the process graph when we talk about stage one, stage two. This is uh, from the utilities filing, and this is what we're this is what we mean. Um, Chris Wendland has another question. Uh, the model assumes New York is winter peaking in 2035. How many ISO zones become winter peaking prior to 2035? And do we have the approximate timing of when the zones switch over? Um, can we can we answer that question? I, I think we'd probably have to take that one back and look at the. I think there's some spreadsheets online, uh, the zonal you know information on the integration analysis load forecast. But we I don't think we have it available right now. But we do have probably an answer for it. It's <laughs> just not right now. We, okay. we have it, uh, again, our modeling is done sort of at the super zonal level. I think we have a way of segregating to the zonal level. Um, I don't have those stats in front of me right now, um, but it's something that we can provide as part of our, our load shape. And okay. We're leveraging information that NISO is gonna be using for our neighbors, so I don't know the answer to that question. Thank you. Okay. All right, I'm not aware of any outstanding. Oh, Aaron, your hand is up. Yeah, actually, um, if I recall from the order, there was discussion of taking into account local transmission 
um, within stage one. And I guess I should pause first. Am I mistaken on that? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not off the top of my head remembering. I, re I recall the, I believe the commission did not want the utilities to make broad brush adjustments um, on their own for interzonal. And then there was some sort of iterative process. I think the commission was laying out and suggested that they, that we should take into um, consideration during stage one some transmission cost in terms of the resource expansion model. That's my recollection, but I guess I'll pause, and, uh, you know, for the state folks, you probably have this order memorized. Am I mistaken on that? I, I think there's two things going on there. There was that interaction between um, bulk potential public policy transmission projects that was discussed, uh, but then there was a separate discussion about wanting to incorporate potential subzonal um, transmission costs that may be associated with some of the generation build outs and making sure that we were able to represent somehow in the early stages of the modeling some of those costs so we're not um, creating uh, results in the scenarios that show what's supposed to be the cheapest you know generation build out to hit our goals but actually have all these extra uh, subzonal transmission upgrade needs to make it actually not the best scenario and we wanted to at least be able to capture some of that in the early stages. So I, I know, you know, on that second point, we did explicitly want to have some representation of those kind of like granular uh, T and D potential costs to put in there. there. I think we we use the term conceptual um, yes. costs that we're working with the the JU on. Uh, but then there's also the discussion of you know making sure that if there are those like you said interzonal constraints, whether it's within a utility territory or in be, uh, between territories that we're able to identify those early on and have a discussion about them as well. Um, so we're not, you know, artificially ignoring them and then overbuilding, you know, multiple potentially more expensive um, lower voltage issues that we could have solved with like maybe a single higher voltage issue. So those are both things that we are moving forward on in this process. Okay, yeah, that's that's great. And now the question to this question is to the ISO. Um, we, you folks will be doing in the outlook three scenarios, one, including the state scenario. In addition, though, I believe you do sensitivities on the scenarios as well. Am I mistaken on that? And how many do you do if it's okay? So we're not sure how many we're going to do yet. It's kind of as time allows, um, but. The, the way that the order for CGP key is laid out is that there's going to be three scenarios. So there's the state scenario that is part of the outlook and kind of overlaps between the two, and then there's going to be two after that. Um, I don't believe there's intent to run sensitivities, um, and it's probably worth taking a quick minute, minute to uh, explain the difference between what I think a sensitivity and a scenario is. Sensitivity is a singular change on an input to a scenario. So you run a case, you change one variable and see what the impact of that variable is. Most oftentimes a scenario is kind of a different view of the future world and you run that through your models. So I do not believe that there's intent to run sensitivities on the state scenario through the outlook process. I think the intent is to move on with the second two scenarios uh, after this first one, the state scenario is complete. But as part of the outlook process, uh, there will be opportunities to run sensitivities on potentially the, the other two policy scenarios. Does that help, Aaron? Yeah, it helps. I think I think what will this will come down is after our break in discussing process, you know, some of the concerns Raya raised and things like that. You can see where there could be opportunities. While I appreciate we're really tight on time. Which is, which is, I, I understand everybody has a lot on their plate. Um, and, and having, I believe somebody mentioned that the other scenarios would be bounding this one particular scenario, that that is a possibility, but then we, without doing at least some sensitivities on the state scenario case, 
it somewhat limits how to inform, perhaps how to bound the other scenarios. But I don't want to take up the time now for this Q and A. I have a feeling that's more of a process that we can talk yeah. after our break. Yeah. If you don't mind, if you don't mind, Aaron, um, uh, I see Jeff Mars' hand is up. National Grid. Yeah, hi, Jeff Mar, National Grid. Uh, this is following up on the, the question that Tom just put in the chat. Uh, I was a little confused, or we are a little confused. Where, where is the this information, like this upgraded integration and integration analysis uh, that NYSERDA is referencing? Is, can we find that somewhere, or could you put a link to it? Sure. The link in the chat is the right one. Um, and we've been talking about many scenarios and many sensitivities. Uh, it highlights the complexity of having sort of a living analysis like we have. Um, so in terms of the year vintage, we're thinking about this in terms of our reference case. Um, as we go forward, we may add more policies into our reference case and that'll be a new numerical vintage. Um, because we haven't changed our reference case from the version that was published in the final scoping plan, we still called it 22 and revised. Um, because it's really the same set of inputs, uh, same set of input assumptions, but for those four changes that we made as part of the um, climate assessment that we're doing. So if you click on that link and you look at Annex 1 and Annex 2, those are the latest ones. I did want to draw a distinction, though, and make sure folks are just, I, I know we've said this multiple times, we're not proposing to use the whole integration analysis case for this CGPP work. We're looking at the load assumption and then a number of the supply assumptions, but you'll see in those in those annexes information on our integration analysis build out. Those are useful comparison points, but again, we'll be running new supply side models as part of this work. Thanks for the clarification. Thanks. Okay, I'm not sure that we have any more. Uh, oh, my, my hand, my hand is up. Oh, who's this? Oh, Raya. Okay, Raya for the EJ uh, uh, um, group. Yeah. Yes, Raya Salter for the Energy Justice Law and Policy Center and also a member of the Climate Action Council. Thank you. Yes, I hadn't introduced myself before, but that's very important. Um, so, yes, I just wanted to circle back. If you could give me some just a little context about the assumptions related to generation retirement. Um, a, you know, um, thinking about the, you know, the NIPA peakers, but also um, other plants, you know, pursuant to um, the scoping plan. And this is another area where there's some, you know, some additional process, I think, that's going to unfold. Yeah, I think we had some, you might have missed it, Raya. Maybe, oh. maybe, maybe you were uh, uh, turned away for a moment, but we had some discussion around that. Can oh, somebody, okay. Forgive um, somebody summarize? I think the conclusion was we have some work to do because it's fairly uh, non problematic to. Um, Agree on age age driven retirements, economically driven retirements is a little more difficult because of confidentiality issues. So I think there was consensus that the NISO team and the state team need to think about those things a little bit. All right. Thank you very much. Apologies. Uh, I appreciate the roundup. Apologies sure. For the sure. No problem. No problem. Uh, I, I will offer that as folks probably saw that through the Climate Action Council process, the Just Transition Working Group pursuant to the CLCPA did identify um, a subset of um, plants for retirement. Um, I don't know if folks have, are aware of it, if they've looked at it. If not, I will, I will also forward that information. I assume others probably are aware of that, but feel free. Um, okay, anybody? Uh, am I, I overlooking? There was just one, one more. It kind of got yeah. um, passed in the chat because uh, it's like three or four up now. But um, there was one from Paul about power flow modeling and making sure that it's going to be compliant with the assumptions under the new seasonal ratings in FERC 881. And I, I presume the answer is yes, but maybe someone from the JU could speak up there. Somebody from the JU? Uh, this is Jeff Marr from National Grid. I, I think we would have to discuss that a little bit more. I mean, I think the main thing with 881 is a focus on ambient adjusted ratings and, uh, you know, the power flow snapshots that we'll be using. We'll focus in on a couple of key um, periods, you know, a light load, summer peak, winter peak, 
So some of these, you know, snapshots would be unaffected by revisions to uh, ambient adjusted or, or uh, changes to ambient assumptions that we would see in real time operations. Uh, but we can think more about that as we move into the later stages. Yeah, Jeff, and I think, you know, at least, you know, I think we're thinking about potentially now a spring and a, and a fall seasonal rating in, in addition to the, you know, the, the summer and winter rating. So again, you know, as that evolves the timeline rating report, you know, I think that's maybe important, especially if we're going to look at least call solutions about the, you know, what kind of curtailment is actually occurring. So. Yeah, and just, uh, I agree that again, we, we will look at like a light load case or a shoulder case, and that could be material to that, but timing is probably against us. You know, we're going to be looking at these cases uh, in the next six months, and I, I don't think we've really landed all the impacts of 881 yet. The implementation is required 2025, no? So the actual data won't be available until after that time frame. Yeah, thanks for clarifying. That's that was the point I was trying to make. Yes. Okay, so so time check. Um, I think we had proposed to take a quick break at this point, um, uh, and uh, and then kind of return and move to the last part of the agenda, which is process and administration and logistics. Um, very much appreciate everyone's attention and uh, attention to this, you know, initial presentation on the state uh, scenario um, and all the questions. Um, so let's 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 take five minutes or so and and reconvene by my watch. Uh, yeah, two minutes after noon, <laughs> and we'll uh, pick up with the last part of the agenda. All right. Thanks again.
Okay, it's Liz Grisaro again. I think we're back. Now comes the fun part. Um, so we kind of want to do open, you know, open ideas uh, with you about how to, um, you know, how how to how to move forward. Um, NISO folks and others love to have you stick around, um, uh, uh, but not essential if you guys are uh, busy. Um, uh, so anyway, so we thought we should talk about um, logistics of meetings and process and uh, cadence. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, we're, we're open to suggestions as far as uh, how people want to do things. Um, utilities, you know, you have a big voice here too. This is, this group is fundamentally intended to, um, you know, help provide input to your process. So, um, Aaron, you want to start? Aaron, did you have a question? Sorry, I was double muted. I think what would be, um, and I don't think we'll have to get into the details right this very moment, but over the course of this hour that we have left, I think there's the near term organization that we need to um, talk about and then the longer term. Okay. So I'm just framing it in the, that two buckets. Um, yeah. So in, in the near term, I'll just pose in the near term, what I would very much like to see is um, the list of assumptions that will be shared with the New York ISO. I think if um, state staff can please develop a matrix that identifies what information is going to the New York ISO and the corresponding source, if it links back to, I think it was called the Annex um, Spreadsheets, if you could just tell us the tab that it is linked to. So we have the opportunity to really take a look at the substantive assumptions that will be going over. That would be a big help, I, I think. Um, so, and then the longer term, um, I think I'll just stay quiet and let other people throw out some ideas. I do have some thoughts, but I'll pass that off to others. I, I, I think, uh, Skylar, do you want to respond? I think we've, we can do that. Yes, absolutely. I, I was thinking that's a, that's a great suggestion. We've been uh, kind of racing to try to put that together and barely snuck in to get um, just the, the best thinking uh, we had onto the NISO matrix for posting, you know, yesterday morning. That's going to be built out even more, um, but it currently, whatever's posted on the ESPWG site right now for that matrix is our, the best available thinking. It'll be updated and fleshed out even more. Um, and that's a document um, that we hope to have um, separately on our whatever EPAC page we end up being able to have um, right. so that we can show, you know, scenario one, two, and three of the CGPP all together with the full matrix filled out. Um, but we can link that. I think Jason actually may have already thrown it in the link. And, it, um, and when you look at that um, matrix that was posted on the ESPWG, it's the farthest right hand column is the one that uh, relates to the. CGBP scenario one. And that's and that's really helpful, Skylar, but if we can make sure it's complete with what corresponding worksheet in your respective um, Excel spreadsheets that the data is coming from would be really helpful. Sure. Yeah, I think we did. We tried to put in the source whenever we had it, but I don't think we provided necessarily like clickable links or individualized like tabs where the data is actually coming from. So we can try to add that as we move forward here. Thank you. I, I, I see Bill raising his hand and I just want to cut. I'm going to get to you, Bill, but, but I kind of want to um, ask the group a couple of uh, threshold questions before we kind of get into things like where's the data? Um, and that is, do do people want to have a follow up to this meeting, to uh, you know, ask any, ask further questions about the state scenario? Because if we do, we need to schedule that lickety split. Yeah. 
I would like that. I would welcome it. I'm trying to figure out how to put a thumb up, and I, I'm sorry, I'm nept in it. Um, but I, I, I would really appreciate having that opportunity. Um, I would, you know, after seeing the information, it might be perfectly fine, and I have no questions. But knowing that time is tight, I think it would be prudent to have something scheduled so we have the opportunity to do our job and thoroughly review the data and give advice where we think it's appropriate. Anybody else? Well, this is Paul Harry, New York Transco. I agree with Aaron. I think, you know, we maybe maybe there's nothing to say, but you know, again, uh -huh. I think going over those assumptions, you know, completely would be beneficial before the October first deadline. Okay. I mean we can we can uh we can always cancel it yeah. if we decide we don't really need to meet. Um, Liz, uh, I guess, uh, Bill, again, uh, just uh, one other piece to that um, is that uh, I, I'm more comfortable, I think, than maybe other, others are with the with this scenario, but I'm always game to, to take a look at a few things and, and clarify a few more things. But the set of uh, what, what goes over with it to the ISO is also very, very important in the sense that you know, we, we have the, we, we have a 15 gigawatt to 20 gigawatt build out in 2030 to 2040. And, you know, what the, what the capacity expansion model allows during that time, you know, are, how are they going to decide whether to build a gas plant in 2032 or 2035 in New York state? Is that in the model? Is it allowed? Is it, is it retired after five years? Is it converted to hydrogen? What's assumed there? has an enormous implication on what gets what the capacity measure model decides. Um, and it seems like we need to be aligned somewhat on that guidance. Otherwise, we could easily have the ISO do the, a lot of nice modeling and, and, and have a whole bunch of gas plants built in 2039, uh, which to me would be crazy. But, you know, that's a, a we, we, I think it's really important that it goes with, there's another piece that goes with this over to the ISO as we talk about this. And maybe that could be part of that meeting you're proposing also. Okay, well, I'm, I'm hearing from different parts of the room that, that a follow up would be a good idea. Uh, everybody's super busy. Um, scheduling is going to be the challenge. I, I think I'm going to propose that we do something like send around a doodle poll. Um, and see if we can find a time when, you know, at least a bunch of people uh, are free and can get together. Um, so, so. That's that's what we'll do. We'll try to find a time. Um, Alex, what what is your? That's something else. Okay. Um, so we'll we'll get out a poll of some kind and see if we can find a, a date. It, it would probably have to be you know the end of this week or maybe the beginning of next week, um, because you know the all the state team folks are working to get this stuff finalized and uh, you know and and get it into the ISO process. So. Um, again, apologies. We're on a really tight turnaround time for this particular exercise, just because of the, you know, because of the timing of the NISO work. Um, and we hope to have a little more relaxed approach, you know, going forward. Speaking of going forward, um, the next thing we have to turn to as soon as we've, as soon as we're done here on this particular uh, scenario, is start. Uh, start work on developing the two additional scenarios for CGPP. Um, and I, I, we, we kicked around internally, like what sort of how many, you know, what sort of meeting cadence do we need to uh, establish to get that work done? Um, I think, and somebody on the state team tell me if this is a, a, a wrong recollection, I think we kind of need to um, sign off on those two additional scenarios by the end of the year. Uh, Skylar, am I right about that in the in the that's right? Yeah, so by so, yeah. so we basically got the rest of October, November and part of December um, to uh, establish those two other scenarios. Um, so we thought at least initially we might need to do something like meet twice a month. Uh, what do people think? Hi, Aaron. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I have a question for Jason, if he's still on. Jason, 
are you going to be running the three scenarios for Outlook in the order from low, high, and then state scenario? Or could you do the state scenario first? Yeah, we, they'll tend to be parallel. Um, oh, they, okay, okay. Yeah, there's no, no, in the way it's listed in the assumptions matrix isn't by order in which we're going to run it. It's really just when the assumptions are set. So when we've all decided on the assumptions and then the modeling mechanisms to create those assumptions in the model itself are done, then we run it. So there's no, uh, no real order uh, so far. Okay. And then when do you think if you get this um, first case, first scenario by October 1st, when is the ETA for the result? So there's going to be, it's going to take a couple weeks to get the model set up with all the assumptions we've decided on. Um, so, so long as it's decided, I can safely say a couple weeks, whether that's okay. Two, three, four, I'm not sure yet. I have to talk to the team um, and also have to see what recommendation for modeling changes or new data to feed into the model for assumptions are. Okay. We can keep that on, you know, I'll keep that in our mind as we have these meetings and talk about it, like what's the implication on how long it takes to run and um, kind of have a better update for you on how long we're thinking this might take. Yeah, that would be really helpful. And so, Liz, I asked those questions because do it is two months, two meetings per month, a uh, reasonable cadence. I think certainly um, having those scheduled makes sense. But depending on how the modeling proceeds, sometimes there's a glitch. I would be a little concerned um, nailing down all these scenarios without necessarily seeing the base case, this first scenario's results, as I described before, and somebody else mentioned, we can create other scenarios that can be more of the boundary conditions. And without seeing the results, and here's another plug for some sensitivities for those one variable changes, and perhaps some of the sensitivities, um, we may need more. So I'll just, those are my thoughts based on experience modeling in the past, okay? I think you're muted, Liz. Bill, can we put up the time chart again? I, and I'm, I'm not passing in any way on your, on your comment, Aaron, but just to say that the CGPP is planned to be a 24 month process. And EPAC has to keep up with uh, the JU schedule. Um, so basically, you know, stage one, which is what we're in, where we, where we develop those three scenarios, we have to be done uh, in, order, in, order, in, order not, in order not to delay the JU's work, we have to be done uh, by the end of the year with the other two scenarios. So, subject to that reminder, I just wanted I, I just wanted to give everybody that reminder because uh, we are we at DPS are very concerned to keep this process on track. Uh, it's already 24 months. There's commentary in the comments and in the commission order about how long the process is and does it need to be that long. Uh, and so we need to be mindful of the overall process schedule. So I hear. I hear a couple of voices in favor of uh, two meetings a month cadence, um, and certainly if that turns out to be too much, <laughs> we can back down. Or and, and if we need more, we'll have to do more. Uh, Tim has a question. Tim, re remind us who you're here for. Hey, Liz, I'm with uh, LS Power. Um, I was just I was trying to give you a thumbs up. I did not have a. Oh, question. my <laughs> okay. apologies. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, was there another uh, raised hand? Oh, Raya. Go ahead, Raya. Oh, thank you. Just, I was looking at that chart. I presume, does the 2024, uh, the 2024 PSC review, um, is that, sorry, I the chart went away. 
It's back. Okay. <laughs> oh, I can't there, there, the, the JU filing allows 12 months for the PSC to review the results of the CGPP. Um, that we think that's hugely conservative, but that was what the utilities allotted uh, because they wanted uh, PSC determination on the proposed investments before they restart the study process. Um, and the commission in the order said, we're a little uncomfortable with that. We would like the utilities to come back and propose a way to keep the process going at a faster cadence without necessarily waiting uh, for PSC final decisions. Uh, and the JU are supposed to provide some recommendations, I think, by June 1st of 24 on how they could shorten this thing. Is that is that is that where you were going? Uh, I, well, no, that's that's helpful. And I just I'm just looking at the chart and thinking, how will this process feed into the commission's 2024 review on the efforts related to the CLCPA? Uh, I can't tell you that right now. Okay, no problem. I just said um, that by, by 2024, there will not be any results from this process. So there will right. not be anything to report on in terms of actual investment. So probably nothing. Hmm. All right. Okay. Uh, uh, this, this process is intended to produce a portfolio of potential projects uh, at the end of the 24 month period. And then there will be some consideration of those projects and of those fun, uh, and of funding those projects. And then We'll go from there. So that'll happen in 25 or something. All right. Um, just, just flagging that there and, and, you know, that there are some CLCPA uh, required milestones in terms of planning and reporting on what's happening um, pursuant to the CLCPA. And there's a comprehensive review um, that needs to happen then. And, and, and in, in another four years after that, that there's some complementary processes. Um, absolutely. Or that, that just should probably yep. be. Um, we need that. reflected. I get that this is a calendar, but just just yeah. no. We're, we're we're very aware of that. I'm just oh. showing this calendar. I'm just showing this calendar to remind people kind of what's the envelope for this particular process. Um, I think uh, there was a question from Nick Culpepper. Good afternoon, Liz. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Nicholas Culpepper with PSCG Long Island. Uh, mm -hmm. The, the bi-monthly. I, I agree with that. I think it's you know not, better to need it or have it, not need it, and need it, need it, not have it. Yeah. Um, but I, I was thinking more so like the for, the for the next round, looking at the two additional scenarios. And bear with me, I I don't want to jump the gun. But looking ahead to that and the, and the tight time schedule, um, would it make sense to to solicit inputs from uh, the panelists of the EPAC ahead of uh, whatever meeting we plan to uh, start those discussions? So we kind of maybe a survey or or poll or or, or any sort of feedback from uh, the panelists to help kind of. Uh, be a starting point of where uh, those two scenarios may may look to head. Oh, um, listen, I, I uh, that that's a great idea. I think we certainly would be very happy to entertain uh, you know specific ideas or proposals from panelists. Um, I expect the JU are also thinking about what might what they might offer up as uh, one or more alternative scenarios. So. Um, uh, if 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 other people want to be thinking about that and bring bring ideas into the forum, sure, absolutely. The I, I will I will say again, this goes back to organization. You know, we we should I think collectively work to a model where if uh, people are going to offer up ideas for a meeting, that we get that stuff circulated in advance. We should try to make that commitment to each other. Um, uh, just as a matter of course, so people have a chance to um, at least look at a proposal before it, you know, before we uh, put it on the table. Um, but with that, you know, that sort of organizational caveat, absolutely. Mike Spector. Did you have a question? Yeah. Yes. Hey, Mike. Um, Mike, you're with whom again? Yes, I'm a director of transmission into connection for Grid United. If people don't know, I do a quick introduction uh, because Grid United is solely a transmission developer, and we have a few interregional transmission projects that we are actively developing across the United States. I want to thank DPS for having Grid United as part of the EPAC. I spent my first decade of my career at Central Hudson Gas and Electric with the majority of time doing transmission planning with a few of the people I see on this call. And 
Um, it, it's <laughs> exciting. Back. Yes, it's exciting to be looking at transmission solutions uh, in New York again. My main question is really trying to focus on the next two scenarios. Uh, how will the EPAC operate to create uh, create like mechanisms, comments, uh, yeah, for input input for the next two scenarios. So, okay, well, <laughs> to the extent we've thought about it, and we're, we've all been, you know, kind of on a rushed schedule, uh, we, we've sort of thought about it in terms of communications. <laughs> um, we are working to setting up a web page uh, that would be, you know, attached to the to the DPS website. Uh, for EPAC materials, um, uh, we have developed or are about to send around uh, a you know a participants list, so everybody has everybody's contact info, and you all can communicate with each other directly. We'll be getting that out um, in, in a day or so. Um, uh, so those are a couple of things that we've thought about to help, you know, keep the group together and 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 establish some some way of communicating um, and collecting information. Uh, so we're, we're working to do those two things. Other ideas are very welcome. Um, uh, we haven't thought through, I, we haven't thought through, you know, are there some rules and regulations about how to develop, how to propose a scenario, if that's what you're asking? Um, so does, it, does, does that answer help you at all or was there? Yeah. I Okay. I'm just looking forward to working with everyone to, to figure it out um, with the next two scenarios. And uh, yeah, um, thanks, Liz. Yeah, I mean, I'm expecting we're expecting to sit down with the JU sometime soon and talk to them about what they're going to offer up for the next two scenarios, um, just to make sure things are moving. Um, and as I said earlier, if other parties, other participants want to put something specific on the table for discussion, it's absolutely welcome. Bill, is your hand up for um, another yeah, Yes, or, oh, okay. Yes, my hand's back up, Liz. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so two, 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 two things. One, one thought here is that um, we jumped right in today, and, and I realize exactly why you did that. You really need to focus on this scenario. But, you know, as, as, as an advisory committee, um, there's some kind of longer-term organization that we may want to think a little bit about and particularly about the uh how we after these three scenarios how we engage with the various different stages where review points are how, how we do yeah. all that um so so i would propose that uh maybe next meeting we are going to focus just on really honing out this for the first scenario but i propose in the following meeting we actually step back uh, take a look at the schedule and 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 discuss uh, you know how how the group's going to engage uh, in all those stages going forward, et cetera. Um, yeah. so that's one suggestion. Um, the the other question for you on the two scenarios is clearly the scenarios should align with the CLCPA. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking I can propose a scenario, but who's going to check that to make sure it aligns with the CLCPA? And I'm wondering if you still have E3 under under contract or other means to do some quick runs to to ensure that the scenarios that are proposed are consistent uh, with our overall uh, goals of the state. And so I and I would certainly recommend that that be considered as we uh, as we talk about these further scenarios. Well, maybe that's something we have to talk about, you know, at that meeting subsequent to the to the uh, initial scenario meeting. Yep, yep, that sounds good. Yeah, uh, I think Raya's hand went up again. Yeah, just um, thank you so much for that. Um, um, clearly, <laughs> clearly that 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 we meet the goals of the CLCPA should be one of the primary goals of I think of this of this group. Um, um, yeah, I just wanted to echo that, yeah, I look forward to those process that process conversation that that's been hearkened to. One thing I think will be really important is um transparency. Um, I'm not, you know, and and as you're thinking through, you know, the regulation, you know, are we privy to the um, uh, open meetings law? Um, and if so, you know, that's important in terms of how we communicate with each other um, and that all meetings, um, you know, I know if there's going to be meetings with the utilities, I'd like to, you know, um, you know, have access to that. That is just it's sensitive in terms of of just wanting to promote as much transparency as possible. So um, I'll stop there. It, it sounds like we're going to talk more about process and that sounds great. Um. 
Darren, is that a new Hendry's or an old one? It, it's a new one. Lucky you, Liz. Um, I, looking at that schedule, I think I understand your concerns with um, developing the other two scenarios because it looks like the um, stage two is will be started by the utilities in mid October. Yeah, and, they're starting to get ready. Yep. And so, could you put up that um, one more time? Um, could you put the schedule up one more time, please? Yeah, we can do that. And, and let me remind everybody that, you know, from the beginning, the aim, the commission's aim with the with establishing the coordinated grid planning process was uh, achievement of CLCPA. Yeah, and so, just so that to is so, so that so that that that's that's the kind of you know mandatory framework for the for for what we're doing. Absolutely. Yep. And, but just to to go back to Bill's point, um, I'll just my one quick comment on that while the schedule is getting brought up because that's an important um, thing I have to look at. Um, if E3 had a less granular representation of New York State, they had those super zones or whatever versus the ISO doing it more granular. I'm not I, I'm not sure we'll really gain a lot of insight in terms of meeting CLCPA, just a quick observation on that one. But um, so I don't see the presentation up anymore. So so maybe we'll just do this, do this from um, my memory of the order is, so stage two starts in October and it has to be complete by, the end of January, is it? That, that's the part that I'm trying to remember from the Gantt chart. Can we get this chart up again, please? Maybe we should just leave it up for the duration. Yeah. And to, to <laughs> this point, though, like this is not necessarily the, um, the actual uh, schedule we're following. This is the initial proposed schedule, just to give you a sense of like what we're dealing with of a three-year cycle. Some of these dates have been moved around a bit by the, the order. Um, such as, um, I think the end of the stage one was ordered to be June 2024 or something like that, along with a report on how to shorten the timeline of future CGPP cycles. So this is just for, for reference on like how the stages interact. You'll see they're um, overlapping a bit because you have to be uh, building and constructing the models uh, before you get the inputs from the previous stage, so you can kind of parallel path some items so that your, you know, say stage two model for the network model development is ready for when the CGPP stage one data comes out and you can start putting that in. So that's why they're overlapping here a bit. Uh, but that was just kind of some feedback from some of the things I'm seeing in the chat. But, but, but for clarity, I don't believe the commission said stage one doesn't end until June 1, 2024. What's required June 1, 2024 is staff's mid-cycle assessment. So wherever the process is at that point, staff is supposed to provide an assessment to the commission. Um, so and if, if so the, the this 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 chart is still the best thing we have for organizing uh, organizing the work. Maybe that should be on the agenda. Uh, create a new Gantt chart. <laughs> you got it. I, mean, you got got it. it. <laughs> I was just thinking that, you know, when we're seeing the assumptions, you know, so Liz, we can give you feedback, preliminary feedback now for the next steps. But yeah. I think with the next, um, when we see the modeling assumptions, having that scheduled kind of laid out will be helpful. Uh, well, it'll depend on to some extent on the JU because again, this is their process. So if if the JU want to propose, if the JU want to take back uh, this chart, which originated with them, and and do an updated version, kind of reflecting where we are in 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 real life, that would be fine. Uh, does that could somebody on the JU side um, take that little project back? Yeah, Liz, this is Martin. We can take it back, but uh, what's the ask actually? If I can hear it again, do we do we need an update to this uh, Gantt chart? Uh, you know, to reflect. Do we need to update our schedule here? Is there is there is, is there anything that you think we need to um, move around, given where we where we are today? 
in what was specified in the order, correct? Liz? Well, yeah, for sure, but um, okay. Okay, we'll take it back, Liz. Yeah. So we'll see if we need to update that. And, and Thank you. Keep... But again, you know, our, our schedule right now is driven by the outlook schedule, which is we have to get through scenario state scenario, you know, by the end of the year. I'm sorry, we have to get through the state scenario by the end of this month. Uh, somebody else, was there somebody else? I see two hands. Oh, yeah. And, and the play. Who's up? Hey, Liz, uh, this... Go ahead. Hey, Liz, this is Ken Way from uh, Next Air Energy Transmission. Mm -hmm. um, just, uh, I guess, following up on the updated Gantt chart, um, I have a question about whether the JU or DPS can provide kind of a more revised process map for this Gantt chart, given the changes um, from the, the BSE order, the modifications they made to the original uh, JU proposal. I, I think uh, the JU just said they would take that back and see if they could produce something. Okay. Yeah, just, just uh, put another vote towards that. Um, yeah. and, and also, is there a formal written process to submit comments, or um, it, is it just kind of the, the comments that are verbally presented here? Uh, we don't, I mean, the, the, we're, we're inventing the process, right? Um, and our, our suggestion was, uh, we thought about it so far as to say we should have a joint list of uh, contacts, which we hope to distribute to you shortly. And we're trying to put to get, trying to, uh, set up a, an EPAC website for meeting materials and, and agendas and whatnot. Um, but other than, other than, and, and we so far have continued, we will continue to maintain the EPAC email address uh, if, if folks want another mechanism for uh, submitting comments to the group we can think about that but those are the things we we had we're trying to put in place or have put in place so far okay i mean the the epac email address would probably be good um to for epac to accept comments for you know our bi-monthly meetings I mean, we'll, we'll do that until it, until we decide it doesn't work, you know, um, or that we want something different. That's sort of the way I look at it. This is a new, you know, this is a new effort. So, hey, I think Raya had another comment. Oh, yes, I, I actually, um, thanks to the pr previous person, I had a, a similar question about okay. what is the best way for us to get information um, to to you and I guess also by extension, the state team in terms of feedback. And it sounds like we're going to use that EPAC um, email for, for, the time. for now, and yeah, that sounds the, fine. Yeah, and, for the time for the time being, and, and we will, you know, we will, uh, somebody on the receiving end of that email will, you know, try to get messages out to everybody. Okay, and presuming if, like, we want to give information to the state team as well, that that can be forwarded from, okay, yeah, from that, that email too. Yeah, for now, I think that should be our collection point and, and we will try to distribute material. If that becomes super burdensome, we may have to look for another way to do it. Okay, that sounds good. And I just wanted to, again, just, I, I you know, I understand that there's, you know, the JU are doing things, but I would, um, I also, you know, um, have a specific process question in terms of this chart. I do hope this group can have, you know, I think we need to mark that 2024 comprehensive review. Other folks, you know, we want to see the chart updated pursuant to the updated um, orders um, and other folks may have comments just that I would take issue with this belonging to the JU. <laughs> you know, I think that um, uh, what we're trying to get here is, is, you know, for the commission to make the decisions in the public interest. Um, and I certainly hope that, um, you know, members here will be able to, you know, give comments to, to things like this chart and schedule, very much understanding that they're, um, you know, that folks have mandates and they have timelines. And I do understand that. And that's very important. Right. They, they're under, they're under obligation to deliver, um, to the commission and we all want them to meet that. We all want them to meet that, uh, that obligation, I think. So, yes, but this is, you know, that this is just, just that this is not the, you know, this process is not belong to the JU. It's not for the JU, you know, it's for the commission and the public interest. 
All right, well, without characterizing the nature of the process, because um, <laughs> uh, I think the commission talks about it in the order and I don't want to, I don't want to say something that would be inconsistent. Um, so, uh, so we're agreed, at least in the, in the short run, uh, we're going to get some kind of a polling out to schedule the, uh, quick turnaround meeting on, on the state scenario. Um, and, uh, I think, uh, staff will, will work towards, um, calendaring uh, a couple of months worth of, uh, of meetings for scenarios two and three. Um, and so you all should uh, look out for messages on those topics. Um, is, are there any other kind of organizational uh, ideas or, or principles that people want us to think about? And people, people are more than welcome to, you know, consider that question because we're talking about how do we want to organize ourselves kind of for the, you know, October, November, December and beyond timeframe. Um, we don't have to answer that question today because um, I think we know we need to do in the, in the short run. Uh, but, you know, we're open to thoughts about, uh, you know, what, what, what kinds of approaches have been successful in the past. I've already made notes to myself about, if we continue to do these things virtually, there may be better ways to organize the Q and A. Um, uh, Aaron, you had a question. Yeah, um, I I really don't want this to be burdensome, but I think it could be really helpful is to have um, meeting bullets that says discussed, decided need to clarify just kind of like a punch list to keep track of where we are and what the next decision points are. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, otherwise, we can tie ourselves in knots and sometimes we could be repetitive on right. things that we've already discussed. I think from an efficiency perspective, it could help. Again, not meeting minutes that are voted on or whatever, just kind of like a punch list of where we are. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of good reasons to do something like a like a punch list. Um, so we'll 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 figure out. And but you're right, we have to ask somebody to do it. <laughs> um, so let let's put that on the list. Thanks for that. Thank you. And similarly for you guys, you know, uh, now we're asking you to like you know devote probably several more hours a month, several hours a month to this, and uh, we realize that that's hard for for people. Um, and anything we can do to make that a, a little more straightforward, um, we should think about. So, okay. All right. Well, I've heard I've heard um, good points about um, uh, organizing. The, you know, organizing in the future. Uh, we'll we'll shoot for the twice a month meetings, unless that turns out to be wrong. Um, and uh, and we will set up this next meeting as soon as possible and follow up after that with some you know further thoughts around uh, the you know the the subsequent meetings. Um, does that sound good to everybody? It, it sounds good in the next meeting um, for to assess whether or not we even really need it. We, we will need to see what those assumptions are. So I think from a scheduling perspective, we might ask um, you folks to consider when you can get the matrix assumptions matrix to us. Um, and then we can then decide the subsequent meeting and if we even need it for that matter, but to get it scheduled at least. Okay, I'm going to defer to Skylar on that. Yeah, the, the matrix is, you know, done and posted in its less specific form. You know, you, you've been mentioning that you want basically that same thing, but with specific links to tabs added to that, that that might take, you know, hours to a day uh, between most of like me and the nice sort of folks to try to track those down so we can put those links in there. Um, but after that, that's, you know, we can share what that matrix, whatever form that matrix is in at that time. Right. So that matrix is on the NISA website as, and it's in the chat. And, you know, I think the ESPWG on Thursday will be 
talking about it. So that's another venue you might want to you might want to listen in and hear hear from hear about it over there as well. We hope everything fits together. We got okay. a question in the chat about what is the process to get public input into this process. Oh, public input. Yeah, yeah uh, that's something else. Well, we haven't um, decided on that. There's some directives in the order uh, relating to expanding uh, expanding communication beyond EPAC um, and uh, staff has not put anything on the calendar yet, but we are thinking about it. Uh, there might be appropriate to have some, you know, public, like a tech conference or something, some public information session, you know, maybe at the end of stage one or, you know, and, uh, but we haven't, we haven't, as I said, we haven't put anything on the calendar yet, but we intend to. Um, let's see, uh, Mark Cottrell, um, I don't have an answer to your question. I'll have to think about it. Um, so I think unless anybody has, um, any other near term near term concerns? I think we can wrap and give you back uh, 15 minutes. Did I leave anything out? Nope. Um, Jalila, if you wouldn't mind sending uh, everybody that, you know, that Gantt chart. So everybody actually has it if they don't. If, I don't think that was attached to your last external email, was it? We'll try to do that. Sorry, it's I just fun. had to unmute myself, but yes, I'll, I'll be happy to send that. I'll send that also when we send the member directory and the doodle poll yeah. for scheduling. Yeah, yeah, until we have a place to post things, we're gonna have to do that for a little while, so. Right. Okay. Okay, well, again, um, very much appreciate everybody's uh, attention on short notice and participation. Um, and, you know, look forward to working with you all over the next several months. Um, and don't hesitate to uh, send questions to the email box. We'll try to get back to you uh, as soon as we can, if it's something that we can answer. Um, and uh, same message goes to folks who are listening who might have questions. We will try to respond to those as well. Um, very good. Thank you and have a have a very pleasant afternoon. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks, Liz. Thanks all. Thanks, Liz.